here with Oscar Prom. Uh, he's the director of software at Deep Local, which is an ad agency that makes kind of dynamic art in order to advertise big brands. A lot of cool projects. Um, welcome to the pod. Thanks, Spencer. Yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, excited to talk with you today, get a little bit of your background and talk a little bit about what's going on at Deep Local. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, what's some of the stuff you've worked on in Deep Local lately? I guess just to get right into it. Sure. Yeah. Well, I guess maybe let me step backward before I dive too deep into the current projects and yeah, maybe sure. give a little bit more of an overview. Um, so I'm Deep Local's director of software. I've been with them for upwards of six years now. I actually came through the internship program. That's where I originally met you, Spencer, was, yep. was there. Um, originally started as a creative technologist, a little bit of a mix of software and uh, kind of working through creative ideas and concepts for these brands. Um, worked my way, the team grew a little bit. Uh, we are now sitting at about five or six developers, depending on, on how you spin it. It's difficult to fill those roles a little bit just because the breadth of software is, is all over the board, just in terms of if you're building front ends, if you're working on back ends, if you're doing DevOps work. So all of our technologists are pretty uh, multiversed in all of those approach. areas. Yeah, and uh, the projects require quite a bit of uh, flexibility as you're working through them, you know, creative yeah. constraints change and things like that. So. I feel like we've got a similar mix. So um, at SK, we work on kind of custom robots and machines, not as much for advertising, but more for industry. So right. it's like product development. And so, yeah, it's, it takes a strange mix of skills. And I guess we tend to go for like a lot of specialists. So we get people that are like really good at front end. And then we mm -hmm. have another guy that's really good. But then it's also a mix. You have some people that are just multi and will do everything. So it's cool you've gone that approach. I, I really like people like that. So they're good to yeah, work. Yeah, it's good and bad. It's it's always good to have experts in certain areas, like you're saying, to be able to lean on those people when you need to get into the deep nitty gritty work. But then you want the generalist too, because you don't want preconceived notions about how to attack a problem. 100 agree. You want more, um, you know, more variety, more input, more naive um, kind of ideas being thrown to the table so uh, i think it's good to have a little bit of both for yeah. sure no I, I agree and like I, I guess at least in our project flow and i don't know what it's like for you but typically i know a little bit from being an intern but typically uh we have generalists more heavily involved at the onset of the project and then when you get closer to the uh project kind of maturity you tend to get the specialists more in there uh just to fill sort of um roles as they come up so like the generalist will lay out the architecture, then you'll be like, okay, we need these guys with these talents to do a thing. And then Got it, like, totally yeah. Up. And you don't, you typically have a network of people. Yeah, so we use subcontractors exclusively. So okay. it's it's really just me and, and a couple of other partners. And then we bring in people uh, as needed for projects, but we maintain a pool of like 75 people that we like working with, and so. Got it, so you have like your you know mechanical movements person, and your firmware person, and your computer vision person. And you got it, and then like guys that are good at like injection molding in particular, or like drive trends in particular, mm -hmm. or like, um, you know, like really, really good at, uh, you need, sometimes you need guys that'll just kind of, you know, carry a shovel and like, you know, get stuff done. Yep. Absolutely. Everybody's, you know, trying to command the ship. Yeah, exactly. You're not really doing a whole lot. And that might be one of my faults is I'm always <laughs> kind of trying to direct things, but I'm not as good at like, you know, I mean, I, I, I like to think I like to clean the floor too, but you know, right. You know, it takes, yeah. it takes a well, it's good to see projects at all levels too. It's good to see them from the highest level to be thinking about the things that are relevant in that scope. And then as you dig down, like being able to get into the nitty gritty and saying, why do these small tasks take three, four or five days? Like, understanding the roadblocks that people are encountering across all levels of the project is just so important in managing it well because 100% um, if you're too far removed from any certain section and you're trying to dictate what's being done in that section it's not really a fair opinion a well-informed opinion to be you know kind of pulling the strings on that so have you ever been in a position where you had a manager that really didn't seem to understand the engineering process <sighs> no I don't I think at Deep Local we have too much of that, and that's mainly because... I didn't just mean at Deep Local, I mean like throughout your career. Honestly, I can't say that I have. I've been pretty fortunate to, to have grown up through good managers and mentors, but I definitely have seen it happen kind of in a, in a hearing about it sure. from that perspective. And it's just so frustrating because 
the things that the issues, the roadblocks that are being run into are very clear, very direct, very natural as a part of the engineering process. But then, you know, you can't just blast your way through engineering. Yeah. You have to take the proper steps and do the testing and do these things in the right way. Yeah. And so trying to expedite that is only going to lead to bad things. Yeah, we call it technical debt. So it's like when you have the client cracking the whip and like they need it by a certain date and like that date is real, but the way to get there is not just by, you know, some great leap forward or forcing the timeline. Uh, you know, you have to compromise on scope mm -hmm. or you have to take a little more time. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's, what are your typical timelines? It's, uh, it's a that's probably insane. a hard question. No, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked. So Oftentimes, I guess we're, we're a fairly young firm, so we've only been around like six years now, maybe like five and a half years. Okay. And so basically, um, you know, we kind of get called in as a last resort a lot of the time. I hate to say it, but that's, that's kind of the truth. So uh, a lot of times what will happen is, um, you know, somebody will, will sort of drop the ball um, or like, you know, previous owner. But that's, that's pretty much a lot of the jobs we've gotten as a previous owner isn't cutting the mustard, uh, or sometimes you have a client that doesn't have the technical know-how. Uh, those ones have bet more forgiving timelines because we can kind of work with them and, and explain sort of the, the precedent. Mm -hmm. But if we have an engineering savvy client that's just on fire, um, a lot of times what will happen is, so like last year we got contacted for something where it was, um, it was meant to be an 18-month project and there were two months of timeline left when we started the negotiation. <laughs> It's a that, fun spot to be in. Maybe it was two and a half because the contract negotiation took like two weeks or like, I can't remember if it was like two weeks or a month, but it was like a bit of time. It always does. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, basically once we got that negotiated, I mean, there were only like a little less than two months left. Uh, we did have to, you know. Negotiate scope. And yeah, all exactly. That. We, we, we got a little extra time. So we got like six extra, you know, uh, we got two extra weeks because of, you know, the fact that the negotiation drew it out. But. At the same time, I mean, you know, we were trying to negotiate scope and we tried to explain to the client, like in every meeting, we're like, hey, by the way, this timeline is not feasible. And we said that like every meeting for like four weeks and they were like, why didn't it happen? And we're like, well, as we explained in the last yeah. four meetings, we've know. been calling out since we started talking about this. Exactly. It's good to come in and be uh, a savior in those situations. It's stressful, but it's also good for business because I love it. then when you have the hard problems, they know who to come to. Yeah. Um, when they've got the crazy asks, the insane ideas, they'll they'll think of you first because you've solved their problem when nobody else could. So that's not necessarily a bad place to be in in the short term, thinking about your long term business. Thanks. That's really nice of you to say. It's fun too. Like I, maybe it's a little bit masochistic, but I really do like the adrenaline rush of trying to conquer like a, a ridiculous timeline. You know, like how how are we going to ever do this? This is absurd. I couldn't agree you know? more. I'm more of a nice. sprint worker than I am like just a you know, chunk here and a chunk there. I like to do it all in 24 hours and then relax <laughs> for a week. So I totally agree. The tight timelines are conducive to that kind of work. It doesn't work for everybody. But... I've been hogging it though. Like tell me, tell me a story about one of those that you faced on. Um, sure thing. Yeah. I mean, let's talk about... Yeah, let's talk about a recent project I did for a, a large sports company <laughs> that shall not be named. Um, we were working on this on-field interactive screen that was a two-way interaction. So there was a, a screen and a camera facing outward onto the, the sports field. And then on the back end was a Microsoft Teams call that was ongoing. Oh, cool. And the idea was to bring the fans and the players together during the time of COVID, you know, remote interactions, things like that. Uh, so we were building out this system and talk about short timeline. So we had three months to turn it around, you know, so that goes into a month of creative time. So that eats into the engineering. And then, you know, we have to define some kind of testing period at the end of it. So that eats into the engineering. So we're shaved down to about four or five weeks. Um, wow. Can I ask if negotiation like in contract played into that timeline? Not really, because the dates are the dates. Yeah, and when, exactly. when things are go. set, yeah, <laughs> it's either like you can do it in this timeline or you can't. And the longer these yeah. discussions take, um, you know, the less time you have to get it done. And eventually it falls off the table as we've right. all seen. Yeah. Right, right. And it's like, when do you make that call if it falls off the table versus, you know, you're trying to entertain it as business. So, uh, but we were in that tricky point. And then 
in terms of sponsorship for this, you know, we were going really up to the wire. I'm talking like the last week or so before this goes live to understand who the sponsor is and what the content on the screen actually needs to be. You know, wow. when there's a celebration on the field, we need to go to the sponsor logo and then we go to a reflection where they can see each other and then we go back to the sponsor. But a week out, we don't know who that is necessarily. Do you have to go or, through standards and practices to get those logos approved in that week that you have? Well, so there's all of that is kind of handled behind the scenes in terms of the creative, what goes yeah. on the screen and what's approved. That's not really, you know, my involvement is on the engineering side Touché. of things. I'm sorry, I'm getting into it. No, no, that's it's, it's a fair question. Um, but what gets tricky then is like you have to be in this period of testing where you're supposed to be hands off in the code but you still have assets that are coming in and like fundamental user flows that could potentially be changed a week out from the project. Just for definition, an asset in this context is... Like a media file, you know, a video string on the screen, you know, a piece of text or um, like a sound clip. Something that makes like sense. That. We call our yeah. graphics assets as well. Yeah, okay. Just, I, exactly. Yeah, Same I wanted thing. to make sure. Okay. Yeah, media files essentially. Um, so... I guess that brings us into Gumband a little bit. And so that's a platform that we've developed internally to kind of solve some of these problems. Yeah, I've been wanting to hear about this. So this is, you know, a particularly useful way that we used it for this project was we uploaded all of the assets directly through this content management system. Which for, is Gumband. Right, which yeah. is Gumband. So this system does everything from monitoring the health of the custom exhibit. It allows you to update the content on the exhibit. So awesome. everything from you know, media files to strings to configuration parameters. Nice. It allows you to schedule any of those scenes out into, you know, at times in the future or kind of switch over in real time to a different configuration or scene. And then finally, it does all of the analytics and reporting, all of those business awesome. intelligence tools. So it's building in metrics and understanding usage of the exhibit over time. That stuff is critical. I mean, you know, for feedback, right? Otherwise you're flying blind. Mm -hmm. So I guess as a hardware guy, uh, sometimes it's hard for me to fully grasp, you know, like the the scope of use of a lot of the software packages. Uh, is Gumband purely software or is there a hardware component as well? So there is a hardware component. Um, so with Deep Local's work, like you've heard a lot about, the output is just so varied. Yeah. Sometimes it's purely software, sometimes it's purely a front end. Sometimes it has a detailed cloud component. Sometimes it has Arduino. Sometimes it has custom microcontrollers and nice. you know, mechatronics. So we had to build a system that was flexible enough to handle all of these use cases. That's awesome. So essentially how the platform works is when you define what an exhibit is or what this single installation looks like, that it's going to monitor health content and metrics. You also define all of the subsystems. So you say like this, for the project I was referencing, there was a touch designer component and a Node.js component to it. And so nice. you define here, here are the two components that need to be alive and healthy during you know all of the ongoing operation of this exhibit. Make sure you're pinging these devices and make sure they're alive. What's your heartbeat interval? I mean, I know that's like low level technical. Yeah, no, it's, it's 30 I'm seconds nervous. right now, but it's <laughs> configurable on an exhibit <laughs> level. So when you make that initial call up to the server, you say, hey, this is how long I'm gonna phone home because just based on use cases, like some yeah. we need to know to the second latency when they go down and some Amazing. we can honestly tell, you know, a minute or five minutes um, whether or not things are online. So does so. it just have to do with criticality of the exhibit or is it? No, it's more for monitoring all of the systems. Um, a lot of these exhibits are built with a few disparate software systems. So there might be a couple of phones involved or there might be a fleet of Arduinos that are behind a wall controlling things. Nice. And you know, some of it is critical to the exhibit UX and some of it, it can function without, and that's UX even the place. User experience. User ex viewers. Yeah. 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 User experience. Um, essentially what we're trying, the, the emotion and the message we're trying to convey to the user. Yeah. Uh, everything, just for some context, everything we do at Deep Local is user focused, you know, user experience focused. Yeah. So we're always thinking through, even as the engineers on the project, like, is this achieving the message that we want to tell to our clients, is it demonstrating the technology in the right way? Is it reaching the right audience? Like, is the user going to feel good yeah. and understand what we're trying to convey to them through That's this? a very design forward way of doing things. And, and honestly, one I'm a big fan of, I think a lot of, I mean, I know I was only an intern at Deep Local, but I think I learned a lot while I was there in terms of- It's amazing to see, first. yeah, like the engineers, 
that we attract are just such a different breed in a way that they are thinking, you know, they're personable engineers that are thinking about the user and the creative side of things just as much as they're thinking technically how to architect it and put it together. That's awesome. Um, and it's a good mix, I think, because it gives everybody lots of stimulation. Like you were saying, you know, you wanted hard problems to solve and this gives people hard problems, not only from an engineering perspective, but a chance to grow in the like, creative and more soft skills. Yeah, which is critical. I mean, was it that is in how to friend, win friends and influence people? Like I'll pay ten times more. I think it's a Rockefeller quote for somebody with people skills than for somebody with technical skills. And I'm butchering it. That's not the real quote, but that's like a paraphrase. But you get the right idea. I mean, technical yeah. skills can be taught to an extent, but if somebody doesn't want to uh, put the effort forth on soft skills, you're not going to develop them. You know, and I mean, takes... we have we have engineers like that that just aren't great around people, like behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. But the ones we really like working with, and I'm sure it's the same with you, are the ones that get the full picture. And so yeah, yeah, and I have no problem with people that want to be behind the scenes. I mean, there's a place for everybody, certainly. Uh, I just feel like the people that excel in the environment that we work, you have both because they yeah. kind of need to be able to go out and get the information they need, and they need to be able to make gut calls on things that are going to impact what the user sees at the end of the day. On yeah. these short timelines, there's no time to. You well, know, you have to everybody. compromise a lot of the time too. Exactly. I mean, if you have to make a tough decision, you have to nix something from scope. I mean, you better make sure you're still meeting the the mission. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and you, yeah. that means you have to have that in mind from day one. Is like you have to understand the creative vision as you're doing the engineering. So that's awesome. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. It's engaging work. Like you say, every day is a little different, which is exciting. Also, a little stressful at times. Oh, for sure. But um, <laughs> it's like, I, I, I know I'm not in your shoes, but I feel like similar. You to see some, the right? same things. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. You know, you know the project requirements change, and you know you're. Like I said, out here driving robots over the internet with people you've never met, and that's a feat in of itself. So. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a nod to the sort of stuff you're doing, though, right? Because, I mean, we wanted to create an experience that people would remember. And so, right. It is like you're sitting on your ass. Sorry, you're sitting on your rear end, and, uh, you know, you're, uh, you're basically, um, you know, you haven't left your house in, what, like six months because of the pandemic. Maybe mm -hmm. you went to get groceries six months ago or visit a relative in another state. But, um, you know, I mean, we've all been quarantined. It's, it's been a year now. And so, right. um, you know, I think everybody wants to, um, to experience some kind of interaction with other people or, or with, and I mean, with the project for the sports team you mentioned, I mean, mm -hmm. the sports uh, group you mentioned, I mean, that, that, that kind of hits the nail on the head. I mean, it's, you know, you want to give people a way to interact, you know, even though they can't leave their homes safely right now. Right. By the way, we've both we're, been rapid tested, so yeah, we're, we're good. We're good here. <laughs> uh, no, we are social creatures at our core. Outside of all of this business stuff, if you were to take all of this away, I mean, we still want to interact with each other. We still, if you go back a thousand years, had tribes for a reason. <laughs> um, so... No, there's no doubt that people want that interaction and to be able to give it to them, even remotely, I think is, is exciting. You know, we've done a lot. Oh, of it's huge. I mean, the amount of smiles you'll see on faces, like you experience this probably more than I do, but just with our robot exhibit that you mentioned. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that just to give the mm -hmm. viewers context. So what we did is we, we wanted to give people a way to interact and we saw these virtual events that just kind of sucked. And, uh, what I mean by sucked is you would get on and there'd be a guy there and it's like a VP of sales from like a reputable company. And they're not wearing pants. And so they'll open their laptop. They've got a webcam pointing up their nose. Uh, they're not wearing pants. They haven't showered. And um, they look like they're super depressed and they want to get out of bed that day. And, you know, mm -hmm. you're like, why am I even here? Like, what, what's the point of this? Why did I, you know, come to this virtual event? And so that was what we found in our recon. So before we, we did four virtual events in Q4 uh, of 2020. Okay. And so before doing any of that, we, we scouted out a couple just to kind of see, you know, where people were going right, where people were going wrong. Yep. And we found what I just said, just people that were phoning it in, you know, like the most cool thing we saw was like uh, ABB, the robot manufacturer had um, like CAD of the robot. So they make robotic arms, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a Swiss company for the viewers. They, they make a lot of really high precision robot arms for the automotive industry. But we, um, we basically saw they had uh, CAD renderings of the robots. There was like a virtual showroom, but there was nothing physical. Nobody had done anything interesting where, you know, you could tell it wasn't rendered. It was, it was a real thing. Okay. And so we wanted to have something, you know, concrete that you could actually see. I'm actually, I'm going to cross your yeah, camera here just for fun to show it. But we ended up with these little robots. And um, 
basically, the idea is you can you can drive these little guys over the internet. And so we started letting people do that and interact with them, and the thing evolved. And uh, what we ended up with is a pretty cool, uh, basically an obstacle course. We had a admin person that was a Broadway set designer that got kicked out of her job. And so it sucks, right? But like, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. So we figured, you know, we put her to work and we designed a set that is, is off camera, but it's actually in the same facility that we're in. And um, people seem to really like it. So you'd see people driving these things and, you know, you'd see a smile shoot across their face, you know, because they're on, on a Zoom call. Yeah. Yeah. One of those people so. was me. I got to drive this around. Uh, it was really quite the experience. It was a little touchy at first, but once I got the, the hang of it. Nice. I mean, it really was cool to do that in real time. And something I, I was talking to a pit professor recently about things that he's been doing to change his classroom setup to make things more engaging for the same reasons that you've been talking about. And one of his metrics that he's been using to measure if he's doing well in that arena is asking himself, how much of this meeting could have been pre-recorded and watched back after the fact? If yeah. it's more than 25, 50%, then like this was an unnecessary meeting. It could have been an email. It could have been some kind of asynchronous communication. Like I want to be doing things that are collaborative and spontaneous in nature over remote calls and interactions and things like that. And this is a great example of that. Thank you so um, much. So it, no, it was a lot of fun to do. It's the highlight of, of some of the things I've done on Zoom calls. I appreciate that. So uh, yeah, lots of fun. Yeah, but it's not it's not like getting into a stadium having something traverse the perimeter like that's way cooler you know it's um deep local has taken me some special places over the years i'm super thankful for that um so like what was, else like can, what can you yeah, yeah i can talk about a couple of the other things yeah. i've done uh, my first project at deep local i was about two months in nice it was a shoe selfie machine so this we built Adidas? this was for big tech brand sorry B. yeah um but we, we partnered with AS Roma, which was Rome's, like, one of Rome's biggest soccer teams, football. You'd probably shoot me if I said that. Um, <laughs> and we got to go out to their facility. We built a machine that was basically a large turf. Think about, like, driving range, yeah. turf, uh, a big circle that players could stand on. And then there was a rig with a backdrop, a DSLR camera, and an Arduino. Yeah. And it would rotate 360 degrees and take photos of the shoes that the players were wearing. Yeah. And then it would immediately generate a GIF and upload it to social media. So it would just pick the best angle out of out of It the actually made a GIF, so it was like the whole thing. Oh, an animated GIF. Yeah, it made okay. an animated GIF cool. of, of the resulting shoes. And the, the campaign was, one of AS Roma's players was wearing rainbow laces in support of LGBT rights. Okay, and cool. the brand wanted to kind of own that messaging and, and, you know, word out to the world. And so we built this machine, flew it over to Rome. Um, I was writing After Effects scripts at like <laughs> 2 a.m. in the hotel lobby because we all had to bring our computers down because we had one power strip. And it nice. was all European power, so we oh, all God. had to be in the same room. It was 2 a.m. We are like trying to learn how to script After Effects. It was quite the project, quite the I have not yet scripted After inundation in my to, Oh my gosh, you don't want to. Or maybe you can you take do. up a new language, I'm sure, in like a day, right, at this point. Like I, you would think like a software language, but those scripting languages that are specific for like the tools themselves, they just all have their own nuances and you kind of have to know, like, I don't know After Effects that well that for sense. me to then get into the details of the scripting language. So have you uh, uh, messed with PLCs at all? Just like you're asking? Programmable logic controllers? That's what that stands for. I have not. No, it's all good. Tell me more. You might find them interesting. So yeah. I actually just had a mechanical engineer on that was talking about some of the stuff they'd done in the automation space. And I mean, this person has automated, uh, I don't want to say the dollar amounts, but crazy expensive lines. Like, I don't know, like, uh, <laughs> I want to give a context clue, but I feel like it'd be blowing up too much. Well, they did mention uh, a $4 million line automation they worked on uh, wow. on the pod. Okay. And so what it was, was um, basically they got hired to work on a line automation and um, their company carried this thing through. And, and it's really cool because it has to be built to last like 10, 15 years between services. Maybe okay. there's a little bit of service, but it has to last that long. Yeah, minimal and doubt. It can't go down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because the line goes down, it's just costing the, the client money. And Money they spend, per second, and hate that. Exactly, exactly. And so you have liquidated damages written in the contract. It's it's crazy. Wow. Which means for every second down, you get back That's nerve wracking. Or it comes out, yeah, exactly. We had a client try to do that one time, but I, I, I digress. Anyway, um, what happened was, um, 
basically, um, they, they built this $4 million machine. Uh, it could like change like, you know, consumable components out on its own. Okay. Visual inspection stations between every operation. So like, say you're like, um, I don't know, for instance, bending an insulin needle. I don't remember what this particular machine did, but so you're trying to bend a needle like for like an insulin reader and you have to put like a couple of kinks in it a certain way. Okay. And so you put bend one in, it goes through like a, a vision station made by like Cognex or sick. And okay. Like they look at it. They check the angles, um, make sure it's intolerance, and it goes to the next one. If it doesn't pass, by the way, you've got pneumatics set to blow it off to the side and a pile <laughs> nice. of reject. It's so cool. And then, um, you know, there's there's some consumable tooling. So, like, typically you'll have, like, everything from, like, a couple of mandrels, like, on a thing. And then you have, like, a robot come and grab one and stick it in the chuck and, and change it automatically. Mm -hmm. Or you'll have, like, you know, like, just a light that comes on and a human has to come in and intervene, depending on the budget. Basically. Got it. Got it. Okay. Uh, but so they built this whole machine that has all that crazy stuff on it. And then at the end, what happened was um, the client told them they didn't, they paid them, but they said they, they don't need it anymore because they had a competing automation company building a separate machine for a separate product that in the company uh, that had you know, hired them to do this job, mm -hmm. they had two separate groups of engineers and designers and, and business people competing for different products to fill the same market niche. And so... They like took it all the way down. Internally, they set this up. Exactly. And to they took figure it, out the best solution. 100%. And so they took it all the way through to manufacturing. And then they were like, that's not the one we're going to build because the product's not as viable. <laughs> so. Interesting business strategy if you have a big CapEx budget. Exactly. I, mean, you know, I guess <laughs> yeah. you know, competition is the father of innovation, something like that. Yeah, so. no, I agree. It's, it's critical. Um, but at the same time, I mean, that's so much money to spend on a, on a dead end, I guess. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I guess you're hedging your bets, too. I mean, yeah, I think lowering that's your risk because one of the vendors will at least... Yeah, if one doesn't come through, for sure, like now you don't have a choice. You're going to have a <laughs> <laughs> that's wild though yeah uh, that system sounds incredibly complex they're so cool do, he showed uh, me at one point just privately like, uh, mm, like some of the complexity figure automation project that was insane like wow. it, it, was, it was it was a beautiful machine does he do he's not doing work in pittsburgh then that's all over no this the was in new hampshire uh, okay. this particular one was in but yeah these get shipped all over the country yeah this isn't like a thing that happens right in our backyard all yeah. that much but the reason i bring up programmable logic controllers is because we had this arduino versus plc debate that like kind of raged for a lot of the pod uh, it was interesting and and the the theme was like so a plc and there's two of them in that robot i showed you when you came in here okay um, it's it's basically a um, and I first saw these when I worked in the mining industry. It's a uh, it's like an Arduino on steroids. Um, the connection terminals are like fortified, so like the wires can't get yanked out as easy because they're all screw terminals mm -hmm. or spring locks. And then um, basically what you've got is um, you've got a system that is designed basically never to fail. So it, pro, it, it looks at every clock cycle, it looks at like all inputs and all outputs and, it, and it's parallel by nature. And so, um, whereas, you know, you sometimes serialize with like a, a traditional um, microprocessor. So, yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of times you'll, you'll do multi, uh, what is, what's it called? Like multi-threaded operations? Maybe multi-threaded, but like when you have to do multi-passes to like add two numbers together, um, and that's like, like a paradigm. Clock cycles, multiple clock cycles. You're yeah. getting too deep on the, on the firmware enough. for me. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I love I love that low level stuff. Like that's that's one of my that's kind of my my favorite. But yeah, but I, um, I mean that makes sense. Yeah. So you're essentially defining every input and output combination. Yeah, but you can't do LCs exactly. But you can't do like the same kind of cool. Like it's it's way more expensive than Arduino. Mm. So like an Allen Bradley PLC is like five grand. Like the least expensive one you can get from like Automation Direct. Like in today's prices is like 170 bucks. I think. Okay. And then like, you know, versus an Arduino, which is like you get the Chinese knockoff for like 10 bucks or whatever. If, you know? uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. And, uh, or like a mega for like 20. I guess it depends on what you're building though. I mean, what's the, what's the criteria of the engineering that needs to happen to then to yeah. dictate what microprocessor you're going to use. That makes, but it's never going to fail. Like, that's the cool, like it's, it's, you, I've never had a PLC go down and, and cause an issue in a system. Is it more difficult to program than an Arduino? It is if you're used to conventional programming. It's designed for electrical engineers. So it's kind of, okay. there's like a, there's a bunch of languages, but they're all graphical in nature. And so basically... HDL almost? 
I don't know is if that one, That's one of those like graphical electrical languages we learned to pit way back nice. then. That I don't <laughs> yeah, I went to pit too. Uses. <laughs> uh, so, um, so the one I used a lot was um, when I was at um, Joint Mining, we used, uh, it was called, um, it was a National Instruments product. It was, I uh, sound like an idiot. It's a uh, National Instruments LabVIEW. LabVIEW okay. was the name. And okay. so you would basically take modules, you would combine them like a schematic. And so it was like, you know, like these two lines are coming in, those get added together. So you'd almost be modeling like an automatic logic, logic unit in the processor. Got it. And then, but which it sucks though, if you're, if you're a good programmer, cause it slows you down. Mm -hmm. Cause you're like, just give me a block of text. I'll get the thing done, you know? But I guess it depends on what approach you're coming at it from. You know, if you have the electrical engineering background and yeah. that's the kind of thing you understand. Well, and I think that's what they were going for was like intuitive, you know? And, and I mean, it definitely, it's interesting because it's one of those things that like it was definitely made by engineers, but they were sort of, you know, working from a design perspective, I think, when they came up with it. Like yeah. They saw the end user as an electrical one, but it, it comes off as bloated in some ways. Like, so I have a computer science background. I know about like 20 programming languages, give or take. But okay. I don't use it very often, as you know. <laughs> right. I'm not, I, you have your three favorites. Yeah, exactly. Well, and also, like, I, I went to school for CS, and then I decided that, like, I, I wanted to be more of a hardware uh, professional. So I, I went more into the uh, circuit boards and mechanical parts and, yeah, and the integration of that. And so... The um, mechatronics. Kind exa of mechatronics. Exa area exactly. of engineering. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. So I, I went mechatronics, but, you know, I have that background, so I still know how to code. And so... It's a good skill to have because it translates to all of the yeah. engineering disciplines translate to, yeah. to each other in some way. Well, so. and what I found is like I wanted SKA to be like a hardware company when we started. And, mm. you know, what it ended up as is we were making like 75 to 90 percent of our money on software because Interesting. it's all a paperweight without the software. I mean, you get you get hired to build a robot, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you know, it turns out and <laughs> nine times out of ten. updates, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. yeah exactly. And and you know, and just cracking, you know, what you would think would be easy, but it turns out to be, you know, a bottomless pit of a problem until you crack it and then you're like, Oh, thank Christ we cracked that one. You know? <laughs> you feel good. I get that. I get it. No, that's yeah. it, on the deep local side of things, it's the same way. I mean, software is the last thing the last point of integration for everything. So if creative changes, software fixes it. If um, a, a you know electromechanical issue arises and we have to do it a different way, generally software is the most flexible way to solve the problem. So it's like at the end of the day, a lot of the a lot of the last minute decisions and the final tweaks are ending up happening in software. And yeah. so we're seeing a little bit of that same so thing where you talked about gum band earlier, yeah. which is a, a deep local product. Mm -hmm. So um, how does, does Gumpan kind of let you go in and sort of remotely diagnose like faulty systems a bit? Like how do you, how do you get at that there? It does. It does. And it does so more through the upfront programming and the upfront work that you do in building the exhibit. So Gumpan has a piece of hardware called a bundle, which is essentially a okay. microcontroller, but it can be programmed. It has libraries for Arduino. So nice. you can think of it like a, an internet connected Arduino, which I know they have now. Yeah. Um, whatever and so they have some libraries so it does a lot of the stuff out of the box like authenticating with the platform secure communication like um, it does all of the connections with the exhibit so when you provision a new piece of hardware it shows up within your organization and then you kind of use the GUI to drag it into the exhibit that's so cool. it's relevant so that way if you have a faulty piece of hardware you can easily swap it out for a new one Rather that's than awesome. So you just so flash everything from the old piece onto the new one. Exactly. Hot swap, you're done. But so then there's this debug feature that I think is really interesting. So it's like we have all of these GPIOs. There might be a stepper motor. There might be an LED. There might By the way, be general purpose input output. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So the GPIOs, as you define them in Arduino, as you're using them in your code, you also get a built-in online debug feature. So yeah. you can like essentially disconnect it from your active exhibit and put it into debug mode. And then you can read and write to those GPIOs over the internet from anywhere securely. Yeah. So you're essentially testing all of the functions independently for any of your peripherals or any of your you know, external sensors. So this is a diagnostic? So it's a diagnostic tool, essentially, yeah. that you're allowed, that you can use over the internet. And then, you know, as you figure out what's... So you can have a tech on site or somebody that's basically monitoring response Exactly. Where you've got, you know, whoever, you know, your, your developer that is 
implementing gun ban that's running this, that's commissioning the system, as you said. Exactly. We yeah, get a notification cool. that something is down. You know, we can send a tech on site to go and use this tool to diagnose what the issue is. Does it lie in software? Does it lie in hardware? Do the logs say anything over the interface? And then, uh, you know, they can either raise that issue or even just provision new hardware and swap that in with a new piece of firmware. You can flash all of that remotely. Um, so it provides just a little bit of a management layer. But on you need that proprietary of. hardware in order to be able to flash remotely that way. Yes, okay. yes, because Arduino out of the box didn't Bundle. have the internet connectivity. It, um, it didn't have some of the GPIO functionality that we were looking for. So I believe... What was it missing that you added? It was adding some of like the stepper drivers and the motor control that I think... On board. Yeah, there's on board. There's cool. support for a small number of these things on board. And we have now like a standard um, set of motors that we work with. So all of that stuff kind of works out of the box. Nice. So that what's nice about that is like Gumban almost promotes good engineering of exhibits. Yeah. If you're using the health monitoring, if you're using the content and thinking about the longevity of the, the exhibit, if you're programming your hardware in the right way, it allows anybody to put these exhibits together with all of the factors in mind. Can I ask who you're buying motors from these days to go with that? Technic, Technic? I think is the, the name of the company. That's That's right. I don't think we've used them. -K -K. I've heard of it. I, I, I don't think, think we've, we've got into it. You should check them out. I think yeah. they are, they're like, Pretty mid grade uh, stuff can motors. Be good. I mean, but right, they're yeah. they're reliable. They're middle of the road in terms of price. The functionality is good. The duty cycles have all been pretty good for us. That's awesome. So um, yeah, we've kind of settled on that. But not to say you couldn't use any motor. I think that's yeah. just our kind of in house standard. No, that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, this is just it's a tool that allows people to do all of that provisioning and monitor. You know, once for deep local, once a project is out the door. It's, you know, there is a support engineer on it, but that support engineer might not have been necessarily the exhibit developer. Yeah. And so by building things on top of Gumband, you get a lot of that control and a lot of that debugging tool uh, out of the box so that yeah. these people can kind of diagnose. Which means the exhibit developer can actually be the one jumping in remotely while the support engineer is on call on location. Right, right. Okay. You know, we could say if there's if it's a Rube Goldberg style wall with five motors, you know, we can literally go through and trigger each motor independently. Oh, this motor failed and that's why the ball isn't making it all the way across the wall. Okay, let's swap out that motor instead of I mean, having to go in, I don't know, write custom code, trigger these motors independently. I mean, debugging this stuff in the past was a nightmare. And being yeah. able to control every piece and you know component of a system from software to hardware all across the stack that's huge. has made it much simpler for us to debug these but things, especially remotely. If I'm not mistaken, I think that's how automotive transmissions are debugged by mechanics. Like if you have an OBD2 interface to a car, you can send uh, solenoid commands and and see where you know a part has failed for a transmission rebuild. I didn't know that. That's yeah, really I, I interesting. Yeah, I learned from the mechanic I used to. That's to pretty cool. I would bet that happens over the CAN bus. It does. So yeah. OBD two is a CAN bus based. Oh, device. I see. I see. Okay. So it, it's called OBD two, but the heart of it is CAN bus. So Understood. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's um. It, it's a good way to tell if things are broken. <laughs> you know, try to trigger them and see if they work. <laughs> exactly. Like you, uh, what is it? Like a unit test, I think. That would be exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's essentially unit tests for hardware is what we've put together. So, yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, and then combine that with the the content updating over time of you know. We do that too, but we have to write like a custom tool to be able to do that. So right. Right. The fact that you've you've saved the custom tool and you've you've refined it, and now you've got something clean that you can and every product is, is kind of game changing. That's really been the theme of it all is like we have been building these same back end tools over to and do over firmware and over again, updates like and to do content updates and to monitor things. Like we've been doing this time and time again for all these disparate projects. We just had to connect the dots about what the overarching themes were. Once we identified those things, once we identified the pillars that worked across all of the exhibits, then it was just a matter of building something reusable. So how did you how did you come to those conclusions? How did you define those feature sets? I guess that was really just experience. It was yeah. I built so many of these things. Time. I got tired of building them. I got tired <laughs> of building a little dashboard just because I want to be able to trigger something in real time. Like that was the most frustrating thing for me. Yeah. Was every time I have to spin up, and I I don't particularly like front end web development. 
Yeah, I don't. Every either. time I build a project, I have to spin up a little front end web app to just send signals to the back do end. Some to like, do uh sure, I'll take a little bit. Um, and so out of my frustration was okay. Well, let's build a tool. Thank you. You welcome. That that will work across all of these projects. And then we said, oh, well, the creatives are always sending me content last minute. Like, let's build a tool into our existing <laughs> tool to solve this problem. It's like, oh, well, we're not measuring analytics in a standardized way. Let's try to build that on top of it. And then it became this package. So was this uh, like a thing you did with just extra hours, like you personally? It, me and the team. Okay. Yeah, I think everybody on the team has been on board from day one for this. We've recognized the need. Uh, That's awesome. My measure is, if I were to take it away now, I yeah. think I would get some pushback. And so that yeah. proves to me that like people want to be using it. It's not That's just awesome. because it's our tool. Well, it also just sounds like it's coming from a perspective of where you're positioned within the company. I mean, like, you know, or where I guess any developer at Deep Local is probably positioned, you know, I mean, which is, you know, you're getting these kind of, you know, very unique issues. Like, right. It's for developers by developers in a way. Yeah, I mean, but like not are. just developers, but developers within the advertising space working with, you know, oh, yes. people sending media. Con I mean, that that is a unique set of problems just coming from a generalist that hits a lot of industries. And I think that's what we're seeing is we're doing some business analysis to understand where this sits in the competitive landscape. And there are adjacent products. There are things like show control for AV systems. And there are things like you know, visitor ticketing systems and booking appointments. What's a but visitor ticketing system? Um, like if you were to to track your movement throughout the space. So yeah. picture one of these exhibits that I was talking about. Now there's a, a corporate office full of five or six of them. How does the visitor go and interact about all five or six, and and why did they make the decisions that they made? So that's almost like a like a precursor to analytics. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. And so there are all of these like disparate tools out there to manage these individual pieces, but there's no overarching tool that is both flexible enough yet focused enough to deal with this problem. So we call it an exhibit management system or exhibit operating yeah. system. I like the word exhibit, by the way. I've said like kinetic art piece and I've used all these other words. That's what exhibits I call it. Yeah, exhibits. More, uh, it's concise. general enough, but specific enough. It's it kind hits of the nail on the head. Yeah. So that's what we, we call it a general exhibit management system and it handles every, and there's, you know, content management systems and there are other systems for AV, like I said, but, um, AV? that's what audio video got it. I yeah. Audio, things like, um, you can think of your general office conference room setups and just, you know, yeah, digital AV, signage, yeah. things like that. Yeah. Uh, bright signs, there's a lot of technology out there to solve those problems, but not for these bespoke custom exhibits. For sure. And that market is growing from what we've seen at Deep Local. That market, way, I love the word just bespoke. Uh, you know I've the other market I've heard it in? Where? N nuclear. Nuclear. I like that overlap. Uses <laughs> bespoke. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I can't. I can't take credit for that one. That's one that gets thrown around at Deep Local. It's quite a really a bit. good one. I love that word. But thank you. Yeah. It. Uh, but so that's that's where we're kind of coming at it from. Is this seems to be a market that's growing. We have built a tailored solution that works in this area. We internally have been using it quite a bit to just generate value on our engineering team and on the client teams that we've yeah. been working with. And so. We're trying to now externalize it and make it available for people in some other domains. That's super cool. So I almost think of like uh, like the U.S. government selling like their fire planes to ally countries. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's not allies. There is room for everybody to win in this space. There yeah. can be a million firms that are making these cool interactive exhibits. I think it, the market is potentially that big. What's your motivation to do that though? Because aren't you kind of empowering your competitors a little bit by giving them this technology? Um. Yes and no. I think, yeah, I guess they are technically Deep Local's competitors. My only, it's a good question. Like I said, I think there's room for everybody to win. This is not a space that Deep Local is going to entirely capture, nor should it, because like I said earlier, you know, competition is, is not necessarily a it's bad healthy. thing. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, I think there's room for everybody to grow, and especially our company, Deep Local, is owned by WPP, yep. who is a, one of the largest advertising holding companies in the yeah, world. Yeah, they're one of the big three. Right. And so their thought is they can offer it to their network of companies, so it at least helps the group win as a whole, 
versus you know some of the other groups that are out there. So that's cool. They're not our direct competitors. They're our sister companies <laughs> um, that we're we're initially helping, and then theoretically, you know, the the competitors might jump on. What if like somebody under like UBS wanted this system? Honestly, I would encourage it just to make the product better. I think you know my ultimate goal is to make this powering all of the exhibits and you know the bespoke exhibits that are being developed in the yeah. world so you know if our competitors are using it great it just it'll make us a little more on our toes at deep local to build bigger and better things so nice. <laughs> i'm not afraid of, of a little healthy competition that's a that's a beautiful outlook and i, I quite admire it thank you thank you no it's yeah, it's been a wild um, couple of months with the pandemic. We've used a lot of this time to kind of overhaul things. Uh, oh, same. You know, I mean, spend some of the downtime rebuilding things. Uh, how have you guys used this? Oh, yeah. I mean, most well, so we mentioned kind of what we did with our interactive exhibits. Yeah. Um, a lot of the other stuff. I mean, it's like you said. It's you know, you could you could be depressed and lie in bed all day, or you could you know work on the company, work on yourself, work on everything. I mean, personally, I've been trying to you know get into working out more I've nice tried to yeah you know I've, I've uh, wanted to kind of I'm thinking about getting a dog you know just, just my own <laughs> there life. you go uh, yeah let's talk about like more casual things from, from the company's better. perspective I was gonna go casual oh, you're, to business but I, get, I can go back and swing the other way so like I, I think about getting a dog from the business's perspective I mean yeah we, we rewrote our uh, three-year plan I mean we're just thinking about that you know it's a great time to go look inward and think how can we be doing things better mm -hmm. um, we've been making a lot of new relationships um, we've had some successes during COVID I mean when it first happened uh, we converted you know actually a lot of our guys you know as you know we're 100% subcontractors so okay these guys get paid hourly but I mean I felt like I wanted to do something about it and a lot of them did too and so we had uh, a lot of our people just volunteer their time. We donated 750 face shields to, you know, just base a lot of like, um, like kind of minority owned uh, healthcare organizations. Very cool. And then like we, we gave them to like, uh, you know, first responders and. Um, How are you so able to connect with all of those organizations? It, it was, it was, it was kind of incredible. It was a beautiful thing at the beginning. And so I think in March before it became politicized, March of 2020, before it became politicized, like everybody was kind of working together and I'm kind of nonpartisan. I try not to get out of politics. I try to stay in the middle okay. and be friends with everyone. And so, you know, I, I think it was a good opportunity to just kind of try to like, look, I'm here to help. We've got these face shields. Like, does your fire department need some, you know, and I would basically be like that. And then I called up some of our machining partners, like a water jet shop we used a lot. And I said, Hey, would you guys be willing to donate some machine time? And they're like, and the sales guy I talked to said, if it was my company, I would say yes right now, but I have to get approval. And so the next day he's like, yep, good news. We're going to do it. <laughs> great, <laughs> so, great. And then um, we built this jig to cut the bands for the face shields. Okay. And so it was, it was kind of fun. It was like a hot wire cutter and then like two spools that we, we ripped and then cut. And it got the, the cycle time down. I can't remember if it was like, I think it was something like eight seconds a, a band, but I could be wrong on that. Wow. It was cool. It was, it was fun. And then fun new challenge to tackle. Well, exactly. And you get to do like a little time study and you know, you're, you're improving your automation skills, which is part of the job. And so, right. but at the same time you're being helpful, you know, actually it, it would have ROI at more units than we made. So <laughs> the math wasn't really in our favor, but you know, it was, it was pleasurable. I mean, you could watch a James Bond movie while cutting, Right. Elastic bands for the back of face shields, you know, so you, it required zero brain once it was built. And it was like maybe, you know, 12 hours to build the jig. Yeah. And, and so, it improves the, um, you know, the skill of the engineers at the company, which exactly. is obviously valuable, you know, and if you can do that and help at the same time, it's a no brainer. Like you said. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I had one friend uh, who I'm actually going to get on the podcast as well. And he um, basically, uh, he created an open source design for face shields um, and it broke McMaster car. Like they ran out of stock of certain parts. Wow. They were like, you want PETG or PET between these thicknesses and they just ran out of stock. And so, um, yeah, it was cool. And then I was looking at, they had a Google doc and I, I was like, you guys should really restrict access on that. Oh. <laughs> and then they did, but you know, it was like, um, he estimated between one and a half and two and a half million face shields were made as a result of them releasing it. And then they made another quarter of a million on their own just wow. through manufacturing facilities. And so it was really cool. And you, you, know, you know you're, like, statistically, you're saving a couple of lives. And so you feel really, really good about it. Mm -hmm. And so that was neat. That, that kind of, you know, kept the sanity up at the very beginning. And then, Which was hard to do. Oh, amen, brother. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was incredibly difficult. 
right? And so it gave you a sense of purpose. I mean, we had huge deals that just fell off the table, and so mm. you need to do something. And so, right. you, know, you can't sit one, on your hands. It'll exactly. Be, you'll, you'll exactly. Eat yourself alive doing that. So why not help? And yeah. So you know, that was one of the ways I knew how to. And so, I mean, we, we got laser cutters, everyone in our network with a vinyl cutter was cutting the blanks, you know, and then, I mean, we had that jig for the elastic that could rip it way faster than we could use it. So, I mean, that handled that. So you ended up producing then, a ton for all yeah. of those local organizations. Well, that's what it was. I and mean, we'd all sit around, you know, watching a movie on Netflix or whatever, or, you know, Hulu, take your pick. Mm. Um, and, you know, as we're watching a movie, we would, um, you know, we just make facial, we'd be assembling and, you know, we'd bang out a couple of hundred in the night. And so, you know, it was, it was nice. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was all, and then, you know, it, it was really fun. I felt like Santa Claus. So I would get in my car, like the Jewish Santa Claus. <laughs> so I'd get in my car and I, I would have just a trunk full of face shields. And I'd basically drive around looking for like, you know, like, uh, you know, like volunteer fire department or mm-hmm. like, like paramedic you know, unit. Just the like, business that looked like they Or like, yeah, I, I'd look for like, uh, so there's, there's a, a healthcare organization I really like called the East Liberty Family Healthcare Center here in Pittsburgh. Do you okay. No, no. So the movie Dogma, the scene where um, Cardinal Gleck, do you know the movie? No. So it's George Carlin plays a priest. Um, it's, it's a really good movie. It's, okay. It's, it's old school. It kind of to the watch list. Dogs on religion a little bit. But like what I like about it is like the church has a really good sense of humor. Mm. And they allowed this movie to be filmed there. And so I, I really like them. I, I go there for uh, health appointments when it makes sense just because mm-hmm. I feel good supporting them. I went in there and I'm like, uh, how many people do you have working for you? And they, they told me uh, like 60 or 70. I'm like, how many of them actually have face shields? And they're like, we have two face shields that we circulate around. So I dropped them 80 face shields that day and it felt really, really good. And then when I did that, like people were really grateful. I mean, I didn't get any hugs because it's the pandemic, but I got like, you know, the equivalent. Right. And, um, and then they were telling me about other kind of like, um, just, you know, definanced health court, like just places that didn't have a whole lot of money, but they, they, you know, they're people too and they're helping people. Yep. And so I, I just kind of went around sort of like lower income neighborhoods and just gave out face shields. Like it, it just felt really good. Yeah, talk about an investment in energy. I mean, you've got one that's paying off dividends still right now as we talk about it. You know, the good energy that's being produced out, so, of, out of helping out. Thank you. Well, and so I have um, behind my, my main desk at home, I've got uh, I've got what I call my wall of shame. So it's stuff that I'm sort of proud of for my career. Okay. And so I have my, my placard from when I worked at SpaceX. I've got um, my master's degree from Carnegie Mellon. I've got like um, the, uh, the product flyer for the first like big deal we got for the for the Very product cool. we worked on yeah. yeah and then i have three thank you letters from like different municipalities for ppe that was donated and that's the part i'm the proudest of <laughs> that's so cool yeah it's Thanks. it's um it's amazing to help out when you can everybody should be giving back at whatever level they can you know not everyone can give back in the same ways but and it's especially interesting when you can use your talents to give back in the yeah. right ways um, I like to do any kind of like software mentoring, you know, if I'm going to spend my time volunteering, I want to do it in something that I'm particularly useful in. Yeah. So I want to spend Same. my time with like, you know, volunteering on software projects or on something that, you know, I would be, you know, more helpful than somebody else. So who have you mentored? Like what have you worked on? Uh, my mom's a guidance counselor at Shaler, which is a nice. school in Pittsburgh here that I, I graduated from. And so I go in every once in a while to talk about computer science. That's and awesome. if she has kids that has questions, sometimes I'll take a phone call or two and kind of point them in the right direction. I like um, doing that stuff too. Yeah. Just like anything little I can do. Cause there've been a million people that have helped me along the way. Yeah. And you know, I always seek out the people that are, as expert of domain as I can find. And so I, I try to be the reciprocal of that. Have so. you had anybody call you back like years later and, and like just tell you where they're at? Um, you know, I really haven't. I feel like I interacted, like it's so infrequent and kind of early on in their career that I don't think it, it really made... Give it a couple of years, you'll, you'll start right. getting those calls. Right, I, well, and I think... Even if I could have just bumped them down the right route of maybe computer yeah. engineering versus computer science, or like maybe this is the programming language or how to get started in software, things like that. Like yeah. even if I can just bump you in the right direction, you know, I will have done my job. So I remember when I was I was in upstate New York. My family lived in like a really Jewish neighborhood in, in Pittsburgh called Squirrel Hill, and then you know we moved to upstate New York. And um, I was thirteen years old. It was it was horribly traumatic, and I remember. <laughs> 
I was like the only Jew at my school. I got I got called a Christ killer and all this stuff. Oh. I mean, yeah, it is what it is. And I actually developed a really good sense of humor as a result of that, luckily. But, you know, I, I remember I, I kind of gravitated to like the skater and the punk kids. And like, okay. You know, just, I don't know. They, they, they kind of could relate to me. A lot of them were transplants, too. Mm -hmm. And so I remember um, there was one guy in particular uh, named Mike. And uh, I recently got reached out to by Mike. He lives in Manhattan now. And he's a, he's a programmer he's a computer programmer okay. he's making really good money he's still got a mohawk he's fucking nice he's a good dude and so i really really like the guy and um he said that i influenced him toward that path in his career and it made me feel really really good you know yeah yeah i mean think about the seed that you planted years ago is now bearing fruit and that's exactly. a pretty cool thing even the most minor impact i mean everybody has those minor impacts on their life that push them down one route or the other yeah um you know it's all about I just try to be a net positive. That yeah. is my ultimate goal is if I can be a net Same. positive in a situation, if it's picking off a piece of trash on the sidewalk or Same. if it's giving somebody software advice. If I can be a net positive, at the end of the day when I lay my head on the pillow, things will be up. Yeah. Well, and there's stuff too, you know, you're like, do I want to do that? Like, uh, <laughs> you know, it's hard. so much damage to the world. <laughs> yeah. It's hard too, just like managing time and things like that. You know, you want to say yeah. yes to everything, of course, yeah. um, but it's hard to. I, I just remember like when you get a morally questionable assignment. Oh, you know, like, oh, yeah. oh. Yeah, I haven't been on the receiving end of too many of those. I've I had a think. couple where it's just like, uh, I'm not going to say what, but yeah. like, you know, sometimes you got to take a step back and just, you know, it's not really who I am. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair assessment, definitely. I mean, business is. A good part of our lives you should do business the same way you live your personal life i think in that way at least with yeah. integrity so uh, nice. but yeah definitely agreed there so what have you been doing to kind of deal with the pandemic and, and make it better for you get outside honestly yeah. that's been a big one for me and obviously with spring coming around you know i've been doing a lot of hikes with the dogs my fiance and i go up to moraine state park and do that's some awesome. hikes up there i love moraine state park it's off awesome. and it's so close 45 yeah. minutes for Actually, everything did, they offer up there. I did testing on on a uh, underwater data collection system for one of actually no, I'm gonna say one of SK's first client. Nice. I did I did testing on an underwater data collection system in Moraine State Park. I remember uh, me and my boyfriend at the time like rented a boat and and we just went through and took samples. You know, a different. It, it was sounds fun. like nice work yeah. play balance right there. Yeah, it was really relaxing. Uh, are those systems still out in the wild? Right I now? believe so. Yeah. I, they're at Marine State Park, or you just tested no, them? No, 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 that was just the testing test ground. I mean, all over the world. Like, uh, one of the things we worked on for that client, I did up in the United Arab Emirates. I mean, they just, wow. just kind of deployed wide net. Very cool. Are you still yeah. supporting them? Uh, not or on you those handed ones. the whole thing off? Yeah, I, I don't want to get into the details. Gotcha. That, fair, that one, fair that one's been had, the, there was a warranty void issue. It's fair fair enough, fair enough. Um, so, yeah. no, so besides getting outside, um, I don't know, I'm a big golfer, so that I guess nice. that is also outside, but so I played hockey in college and that is my kind of transition sport to stay competitive. But, I saw that when I was looking at your and, uh Yeah, yeah. So it's like a happy Gilmore kind of transition. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I was a goalie though, so I didn't really have much of a slap shot back in the day. That's fair. Um, but no, so I'm playing a lot of golf now, like you, trying to, you know, get to the gym a little bit and yeah. stay healthy where I can. Have a little fun where I can. I was thinking about getting a dog. Like, how is, how's that been for you? It is better than ever with remote work, that's for sure. Um, having a puppy and having a dog are two totally separate things. <laughs> but I will say, I mean, if you can spend a lot of your time remotely or at home around the dog, the puppy especially, uh, the, I mean, that's I've great. heard it's like having a kid, but I don't know what having a kid is like, so I have no benchmark. I agree. Um, it's definitely easier than having a kid, I would have to imagine. Uh, you can't leave your kid in a cage for four hours when you go out to dinner. Unfortunately. <laughs> but <laughs> Joking. Um, honestly, no. I, I love my dog and, like a daughter, and she gives yeah. me a reason to you know get outside in the mornings, take her for a walk, and the excitement she gets from yeah. hiking out in the wild. That's a lot of my motivation to want to do it. It's just I, I want someone that wants to get me out on hikes. Yeah. I mean, it, she's yeah. awesome for that. The dogs are great. Um, I'm going to call so, the ranch tomorrow. And yeah, <laughs> I don't want to push. It. Make sure you have the no, time yeah. to commit though, because those yeah. that first well, no, no, year. No, no, this is something. So like before I got my cats, which I, I have one of I used up too, I was mm. thinking about it for like two months, and I was just like, I think I want to get cats, like blah blah blah. Okay. And then I was at a party, and somebody busted out a room full of kittens, and I was like, I'm taking these ones. <laughs> so. 
Damn. I mean, they were trying to have them adopted, right? So yeah. That was, yeah, that's I guess. how it worked. But... but you leave the night for a party and come back with a kitten. That's with two kittens. <laughs> two kittens, yeah. yeah. That's... It was actually really cute. So, like, we got, we got, I got two, and then my one friend that was with me also got two. It was a party in Ohio. We live in Pennsylvania. Yeah. So, we drove back, and he had a Ford Taurus, and, um, I remember the cats were like all centered in the back three seats of the car. And Jeez. so it was cool. And so I um I uh have never had my cats that well behaved in a car. I think it was traumatic for them because they were removed from their home. Okay. But uh yeah, Do you take them in the car much? I used to, but my, my one cat just meows and complain like she's cool with being in the car, but the moment it starts moving, that's when she gets triggered. Fair. Fair. So, Sadie hates the car too, my great Dane. She's yeah. like not about it. She's just so top heavy, I think, that she doesn't feel very stable as it drives around. Yeah. So yeah, I can I can attest to that. We try to get her in, but it's definitely not happy about it. <laughs> but dogs are great. No, if you have the time, yeah. they are so loving and they time I don't they, have, but I mean I'll make it, right? So I'll just sleep. There you go. If, if you'll it. make the time, I mean they'll yeah. they will teach you some things that you didn't quite know until you got a, a dog. So. Can you give me an example? Yeah, I think oh, so just some one of caring. Don't, don't yeah, really yeah, I'll, I'll refill on this. I just think some like very fatherly skills uh, that you know I wasn't prepared. You're saying you know comparing it like to like a kid. It is a minor, minor, minor version of that. I think, um, and those are skills I didn't necessarily have, and now they are skills that I have to a minimal degree, at least enough to keep something alive for five years sure. so cheers yeah Th thanks for having me on thanks That's for coming this, this, this is uh, really fun it really has been you yeah know? by the way this is like the first time we've seen each other and i feel like since we were interns at deep local which would have been like six years ago at this point yeah i think we Seven. caught each other at a christmas party maybe once but outside oh yeah but of I mean, that that's, that's yeah that's sam blow and that's it like, right this is, this is a real catch up mm. if you ever want to come on again by the way like i'm trying to get regulars on this thing so. oh nice nice yeah that's good to know no i um i love talking about this stuff talking engineering it's fun to talk to another personable engineer well and that's what i wanted to show kind of the world too is, is sort of what it's really like you know being in the field and then practicing the art and so because mm -hmm. it's it really is an art and i mean there's just there's so many nuances and there's there's what you get taught in school that it's supposed this is really delicious by the way <laughs> So you get Agreed. It's different than what you had, though, which I thought was interesting. It's which like, I also like. Variety is the yeah. spice of life. So, um, right. So this one is a, is a High West whiskey. Um, do you want to tell the story? Yeah, yeah. It's just a buddy of mine brought that back from Park City, Utah. A real small mom and pop shop. They've been still in there for years and years and years. And so it's uh you know my buddy of mine. We got halfway through it, and Spencer and I get the, <laughs> the other half of the way. <laughs> Enjoying it a lot. Thanks, yeah. Spencer. Um, but no, no, this yeah. has been uh, lots of fun. No, it's super pleasant. And so, yeah. So, by the way, I started to ask about your tattoo earlier, and then we kind of yes. cut it before the pod started. Yeah, earlier. no. So, I'll, I'll tell the story of the tattoo. So, this is the history of computing. I have plenty of add-ons, but this is where it's starting. Nice. So, this represents the mechanical era, you know, back in the early 50s. So, like Babbage, all, right, right? Even Babbage, before. Babbage, Babbage was like the 1800s. Well, yeah. I... I'm thinking more modern mechanical computing, but it does start so like IBM back machines. With, exactly. Got it. Um, and then the line here kind of represents the electronic era, and these dashes and dots are binary with my last name. Oh, cool. On them in ASCII. And then the ring here represents the quantum era, which I think we're kind of heading into. And Interesting. And that's where I kind of think of that as computing really shooting off. I see that as a real um, like kind of compounding effect on what we see as computers right now. That's so cool. And so that's why like, this is kind of a linear thing that we've experienced in computing up until now, but with quantum computing, I think we're about to see some things that are just gonna blow our minds. Why did you go with the ring? Because I saw that like symbolism in Westworld. I'm trying to think like what- um, I just think because it could evacuate out from all directions. You know, okay. if this were a yeah, sphere, it would be, you know, even more dimensional than just a ring. But I you think. only have one dimension uh, to write on. Right, but <laughs> I can only go one direction right now, so. I gotta get a, I gotta get a piece on me, I feel like. There's two I've been thinking of for a while. I, you just have to do it. That was my yeah. experience. I was literally like on my couch watching, um, I think it was, what was the seven series one about with Daenerys? Um, the name is blanking me. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. I was watching Game of Thrones for the first time because I was super late to the party. It was over. 
Christmas break, which we're super lucky at Deep Local to have off when we don't have client work. And I was sitting on there, I was like, I'm gonna go get this done. I've been thinking about this for six months. I've drafted on my computer 20 times. I'm just gonna go get it done. So I went to Cyclops next door. I live in the Pretty south good. side, right off of Carson. I don't know, I actually ended up getting, <laughs> a, I ended up getting a visiting uh, tattoo artist from Columbus, Ohio, nice. who did this work. Seabus and, is cool. Yeah, and it was, uh, it was quite the experience. You know, I guess that's not the typical way to have it done, is to like have the design and bring it in. They yeah. want to have more input on it than that. So I guess that was a little bit... Um, you got exactly what you wanted. Right, I got exactly what I wanted. I just think the it's artist body wished, like, wished to have more input. So, yeah. But it was fine. I went and got it done, and now... I, uh, I have worked on it in Illustrator. I have another design that kind of works its way to a light bulb on my, on my elbow here and has some inter, interplanetary work that's going to oh, come cool. out from the side. So, um, I really like that. It's almost like the progression of humanity in the modern era. I'm a big like side fan of physics yeah. and just everything like from quantum physics to the way the universe works to gravity to space to all of that I guess stuff. I used to work at SpaceX. Yeah, I've heard <laughs> once or twice. Yes. But, um, no, I mean, that, that was you, cool though. You obviously have share that kind of passion for things. Like, of have course. you been following the Mars rover at all? Uh, which one not? I, so I'll be honest. After I did that, like I kind of stopped following space travel in the broad sense. I still do a little bit, but they just landed a new rover, probably. And I have colleagues at NASA. I talk two to like weeks every ago. Day. <laughs> I shouldn't really be following this. Uh, but no, I just think it's been incredible. Some of the photography that's being sent back. Some of the. Um, it's cool from an engineering perspective because I'm like zooming in on these photos six x to see what the sensors look like and what the cable wraps look oh, like. Oh, Sam! And like, how Sam. are they building this thing to operate on Mars? That's what I want to know. Well, there's a dude from NASA that that is actually doing like part time work for us, and um, whenever he comes in, he has a background a lot of times on a zoom. It's it's the cupola in the uh, International Space Station which is the section they take all those photos of of the earth. And so it's got like oh. windows all over it. And it's, it's just meant as like a viewing area. It's, yeah. like, it's really pretty. But I was like, is that a liquid tight cable plan? <laughs> 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 that little thing in the bottom right. Yeah, that. Oh, exactly. that's too funny. I, I honestly don't know, Spencer, what you did at SpaceX. I mean, I knew you did. I was born. There, I, I was but... just an IT systems intern. So okay. basically what it was is I had a friend, um, his name's Jimmy, and he had gotten a gig there, um, and I didn't think I was good enough. I had that imposter syndrome that everybody has, I think, especially early on. And mm -hmm. probably, I mean, today I still have it. You know? Yeah, I don't feel totally. Like good enough. Always yeah. got to punch above your weight class. Yeah, exactly. And and really, when you get in, you realize you're just as good as everyone else, and everybody's pretending. But like, you know, <laughs> the truth. Yeah, amen, brother. But like, uh, it, you know, I felt that way, and so I was really, I'm like, they're never gonna hire me. I'm not good enough. Blah 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 blah. And so I just didn't apply and I waited until like basically like my last week at University of Pittsburgh in mm -hmm. computer science. And by the time I applied, the only internships that were left were like in, uh, information technology, IT. Got it. And so I just, I was like, yeah, fuck it. It's a job. I'll apply uh, IT systems. So it was like, it was basically working on like the data center. So like mission control network. I remember we, we rebuilt on the weekend. It was like 19 hour days. It was pretty crazy. Oof. It was, it, yeah, it was, it was, stressful. those are the same systems that like minimal downtime. You've got to do that. Well, exactly. Right? And the only time we had to do it was the weekend because that's when they weren't checking in with the dragon module that we had in orbit at the time. Oh, that's cool. And so, yeah, so we <laughs> fucked it up. You know, we had no way of communicating with, with that, that, uh, that robot essentially right, in space. Right. And so, you know, it was, it was an important job. It felt good. Um, what then, kind of things do you take away from that? I'm curious, like, of, of course your role wasn't necessarily engineering space. No, it wasn't really, you but know. you must have been around some really interesting. Well, I was, and I mean, you know that I'm, I'm, I wasn't the average IT guy. I mean, I, I went on to get a master's in robotics. And right. So, like, <laughs> of course. I, I mean, and, and that was kind of a fun excuse to, to discontinue the job because I had already gotten accepted to Carnegie Mellon. So I was like, yeah, I got to go get my master's now. And sorry. Yeah. And so it was, it was a nice transition. Um, but uh, it was interesting. So was there I mean, anything that stuck, like really stuck with you that you could I think talk about? sitting in the man. Well, I mean, it's my NDAs are long expired from then. But I mean, I, I don't want to blow anything up. Yeah, but there's there's a couple of things. So like one is like sitting in the early prototype. This would have been in 2013 from the man capsule and, and just experiencing the astronauts view. You got um, to sit in the like the front couple seats. Yeah. 
Wow. Uh, so they had it empty. It was actually on the third floor of the building, I believe. Because you so, have to like really get up high to actually get in that capsule, right? So there was a ladder going into it. And yeah. So basically what it was, was it was an early um, sort of engineering model. And they had it in there just kind of for, you know, employees to check out, basically. And um, it, it had the screens from the Tesla, like the 19-inch display. <laughs> of course it did. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, why not? Elon's got to reuse. Yeah, exactly. He's a smart dude. I mean, I you know. No he, doubt about that. He definitely is all about the vertical integration life. So that was interesting. I made friends from a lot of different departments. One thing I kind of got crit- criticized for, but has come in handy in my current job, is I was an IT, which was meant to be a service department for other departments. But I had a lot of friends in different departments because I'm personable, uh, like you are. You yeah, know? And so yeah. I remember there was a project I did that was kind of deep local-esque. So it was, um, it was the data center. Uh, we had a really beautiful day. It was probably a certain amount of money that I can't say in assets, but it was, it was a really, it was as enterprise as it gets. It was, it was a small data center. It was only about maybe, um, maybe the size of this room we're in. Like, okay. Like, I don't know, like 600 square feet, if I had to guess. Yeah. Maybe, maybe eight or 900, you know, by the time it was done. Um, you had like 10 rows of servers. And, and this is all on the tour. If you ever go to SpaceX, like you can see this through like a window. Got it. And then I remember we wanted to kind of dull it up because Elon Musk would bring his celebrity friends in. And then, you know, they, you just wanted to have something cool to show him. And like, we all It's so like, like, here, look at these blinking lights well, on the servers. Was, like, exactly. And there was a perk you got as a SpaceX employee was you could show off SpaceX to anybody. So I would get free haircuts because I met the uh, creative director for all the Vidal Sassoon Academies in North America. And she had a four-year-old son who loved space. And so I would get hooked up on haircuts. And for then, tours of space. Exactly. <laughs> it's kid, a good deal. It was really cute. Like I, I brought him through and, and at the end the kid hugged my leg. He was so happy to be there. Children have the best reactions. They're so unfiltered. It's, yeah, exactly. I'm sure that's amazing. It's yeah. just it's just un it's that exactly will stick that. with you forever. Exactly and that kid probably too. Yeah. You know? And so like he'll he'll remember that. I'm sure it'll influence his career in some way. And so um, yeah, it was really fun. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. And then uh, I remember Tracy giving me, she that was the name of the woman, she gave me a haircut. And she's like, that'll get you across the country back to Pittsburgh. <laughs> it was a really good haircut, you know, back when I had hair. And so, you know, it was nice. And so, um, but I remember my, my job was, um, you know, the job I liked the most out of it was I was, I was sort of tasked with um, designing a lighting system from scratch for the data center. And um, we used a DXM512 stage lighting control standard. Okay. It's it's how they control lights on like shows, so it uses an show, XLR like connector. Musical show production, correct? Kind of thing. And, yeah. And so okay. it's it, it, like a lot of those effects, like like the smoke machines and stuff, all plug into that. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so um, basically, um, I designed it to that standard, and then I created a lot of custom circuits. I used Arduino like stuff in it. Um, okay. And then I it was all rack mountable because it was a data center, and nice. then there was like a web interface, and so that was I I pulled eighty hour weeks for like a month to get that built and it was, it was really fulfilling and um one of my one of my colleagues said it makes the data center like it, it's so much better yeah it's yeah. beautiful is and it is it just kind of environmental lighting or is it accent lighting is it interactive it's kind of accent lighting so okay. what it is is it's, it's just rgb led strips that were vertically mounted inside these uh um, like a house shelter thing. racks yeah yeah and so um just just high end right and then but it created little x's on the floor like as a cast yeah oh that's cool and then you could set the colors like based on the holiday and then you had like control for different racks and so i gave them options i wanted to give them more control than that but it was a budgetary decision and so So from that web interface what are you doing are you controlling just set the coloring and things like that Yeah, yeah that makes sense that's I've been talking a lot lately about like think more about the impact of your work and less about the deliverables and like even that the impact of your work about the the number of people that will go through that data center and will think that data center is that much more interesting because of the system that you built. Thank you. I mean, it really has long-term ripple effects. I don't think enough people think about those little things. It's like those little things carry on indefinitely. Well, that's why you get to build it to last. Like, I mean, that's... Right. And I didn't know that back then. Actually, it only lasted (laughs) about two years after I installed it. You need a gum band. Yeah, I needed gum band. And, And, you know, like better documentation it's just a thing i've since learned yeah but, we all need better documentation yeah, i mean this was like my first project out of school i mean that i ever did that i'm proud of you know and, and so i mean it was fun um i remember um let's see what else did we do that was neat on that one um oh so the, the guy that was in charge of making the building look good 
He had a company called Robot Shop before that. Okay. And um, not the robot shop in the airport, right? No. So this was um, they sold robot parts, and and he uh, he sold it off. But when I was in high school, I remember I, I would browse on this website. I somehow found it like in like the uh, the early two thousands on the internet. Got it. And um, I, I would get my parents to buy me stuff off it, and then I would put together like like pretty basic robots. But like I, I was starting off at like twelve years old. Okay. And so yeah. I mean, it was a passion from a very early age, and that website delivered it. When I met this guy and he said I sold a business called Robot Shop, I hugged him. <laughs> like, I was like, "Can I give you a hug?" <laughs> so, so I just ran out. That's what I mean. The impact. I, miss, I was over twenty years old. I just I was like that little kid. You know, it's like it was very circular. That's that's awesome. Yeah. I I shared the sentiment of understanding. I wanted to do this stuff young. I used to always like take apart the spare old computers. I used to take apart my remote control for the TV. My mom nice. hated me because I could never put anything back together at the time but i really really <laughs> like to look at the circuit boards yeah so i would just kind of take things apart and then leave them astray on the floor and she oh, no. would come and yell at me and ground me and then we would buy a new computer so it's, you it's know amazing. eventually i figured out how to fix them but it took nice. me 10 years well you know you live and you learn oh, yeah that's i didn't I write documentation for that data center lighting <laughs> you, know? you live and you learn you live and you learn uh, i um yeah that's no, interesting i um i have a cousin uh, it's like a second cousin. He was one of the first guys to get a PhD from the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon. So he's my dad's cousin. Okay. His name's Lee Weiss. And he's, I feel bad. He's like a lot of pain now. He's sort of like retired. And every time I call him, he's just in chronic pain. I, I, yeah, I feel bad for the guy. But super smart guy. He's got like 42 patents to his name. He's has the first metal 3D printed part in his office. Wow. He's a pioneer of bioprinting for like uh, organ regrowth. He's Pretty amazing brilliant. stuff. I, I talked to Howie Chosid, if you know who that is, and mm. the robotics professor. It's not important. Mm. But he said, like, this, that's one of five names I could have met, dropped to him that would have made a difference. You know? Oh, wow. And so I basically, um, I have a story about him where from him and his childhood, um, and he took the engine to his parents' car completely apart and then couldn't put it back together. <laughs> no, no, no. I think he could. I think he said, I know where everything goes. <laughs> Just give me I a couple of it. It's fine. Yeah, exactly. He was, he was Meshuggah enough. I mean, like really methodical. Yeah, yeah. Meshuggah means crazy, but like. No, I, yeah. Yeah. That's a Jewish thing. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. I've heard, I think I've heard that before. Um, you do live in Pittsburgh. <laughs> true. I've, I've stepped around Squirrel Hill once or twice. Yes. I go to Everyday Noodles. It's a good day. I love Everyday Noodles. My <sighs> si my aunt used to own the build. Uh, she used to rent the building, so she had an art gallery called uh, Serrani Gallery in the same spot. Huh. It didn't do very well, but like Everyday Noodles, uh, I think is a much better use of the space. It's great. I love it. <laughs> One of the best places in Pittsburgh. I Everybody. call it Everyday Noodles just because I think it's fun to kind of. <laughs> okay. It in. All right. Um, I, uh, I really you're, like it. Your mom's in art? This is my aunt. Oh, your aunt's uh, in my art? My aunt's in art and my sister's an art uh, publicist in New York City. Oh, um, very cool. Very yeah. cool. My fiance was in art for a while. She, yeah. I noticed on my way up to your studio there was a Baron Batch painted. That's what the, I mentioned to you. Yes. Yeah. And so, so I'm like, I, I swear to God, yes. it's got to be Baron Batch because it was. You me it's it was. Style. And I saw that. I street viewed this before I came up here because I'm a paranoid, anxious planner. Fair and uh, I saw the Baron. I was like, I got to mention that on the way up here. But uh, yeah, for the listeners, I have a couple of Baron batches. My fiance used to sell art and work with his social media. Really cool artist out of Pittsburgh, but there he's all over the city. And he's amazing. His street. stuff is beautiful. I'm not even an art guy, and I, I just love looking at it. Like it, it's kind of mesmerizing in a way. You're not an art guy. I'm surprised to hear that. Well, I think I am, but I'm not. Like I, I, I appreciate art and I love art, and I, I really like it. I mean, I spent 14 hours painting this logo on the wall, <laughs> and and you know a lot of scrutiny on on the design process to create the logo itself. Um, and and I, and I really do appreciate like the way art makes me feel. But I don't know the names of artists. I don't really. Oh understand no, like, that's not important. I'm what? not talking about that side of art. I'm no, I'm just more talking about like you know artistic expression. And, oh, for sure. If you get yeah. a chance this summer, you should go down and check out the mattress factory on the north side. I gotta go. I've been told for years. It's, I it's it pretty killer. They have an amazing garden party every year that generally like the mayor attends. It's pretty nice. pretty serious thing. But the guard. Uh, He's got a tech event like this week or next if you want. Oh, does he? Yeah, I'll, I'll extend uh, it to you. Yeah, go. yeah, we should talk about that. I'll trade you. So <laughs> if you take me to the mattress factory, <laughs> I think I can make that happen. Nice. Uh, <laughs> but no, so uh, I get into art a lot through my fiance but i think it's a really interesting thing because i agree with you a lot of the stuff we do at deep local has an artistic angle to it especially like i'll drop some names that some people might know is like jake marsico 
Um, it comes from a very architectural installation background. So that, that is meant to be more beautiful than functional. That's now, cool. at Deep Local, we come from it from like, yeah, it has to be functional enough to tell a story about this technology or this brand. Yeah. But it also has to be beautiful. Yeah. And so I'm getting a lot of that perspective, which has made me also appreciate just more traditional art. Um, and I've, I've come to find it in my life in a lot of different ways, like the Baron Batch stuff and like, uh, you know, some of the other things we've done. I was kind of pleased uh, that I could recognize his work from from when I saw that painting. I was like, oh, there was one of his murals near where I, near where I work. He's distinctive. Yeah. yeah, he definitely is. And I think you can see it from the two. So... Um, I thought I that love was that. Like, cool. When you listen to a song from an artist you know, but you don't know it's from that artist, you're like, that's definitely, you know, a street I hear it. I hear that, or, like, yeah. yeah, in the background. No, no doubt. It's a feeling. It's a feeling more than, it's like, I can feel that art. I feel the art when I'm passing the street every day when I come to the office. Like, I can feel those two things. They feel similar. Yeah, exactly. So it's the same way. You might not necessarily know the name, but the well, feeling. Well, that Baron Batch painting that now I know who it is. And I mean, I have remembered that since you showed me those pieces on your wall the other day, the, the two part with the balloons. Mm -hmm. the I remember, day. yeah, it was, it was incredibly beautiful. And, and so you walk, so I, I, I don't know. Every time I pass that thing, it does make me feel a little better and it kind of uplifts me. And it just, um, it's certainly better than a concrete wall. Oh, amen. I mean, that's, yeah. Isn't that the truth? If we could replace all the concrete walls with at least well, so colored or something. That's one of my favorite things when I go internationally and when I travel is to look at like graffiti and tagging in different countries. So I remember being in Valencia in Spain and just mm -hmm. seeing, and, and like the Eastern Bloc in Europe has got some amazing graffiti and street art. And so interesting. It, it's just really fun to like, like I said, I don't know the names of artists. I don't really understand like what the difference between postmodernism and like Baroque is or whatever. I'm just making up words. Yeah. I, but like, you know, but like, if somebody's going to judge you on that, like that's on that, not on you. If you can yeah. appreciate the art, that's all you're expected to do. You don't have to recognize the artist to appreciate the art. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that's how I feel too. I, I don't know the names of artists or anything like that. You know, my, the most art knowledge I have is from Netflix documentaries, <laughs> so, um, awesome. which they have a couple of good ones. But yeah. was the Banksy one like? Uh, I haven't course? seen the Banksy one yet. It was pretty good. There was a. My dad was telling me about it. I kind of dug it. There was one that I can't remember the name, but it talked a lot about the business side of art, which I thought oh, was cool. incredibly interesting. Just because art is so speculative, the you know how do you define the value of a thing that is abstract? Yeah, and one of well, the things also beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So like. How do you right, something is only worth what that. somebody will pay for it. Correct. It's the same as like real estate. You know, yeah. you can list your house for a million, but you same might as... only sell it for three hundred thousand. Exactly. Every commodity, right? You know? um, but one of the most a quote that has stuck with me a long time from that documentary was, um, "It's oh no, I lost it. it. It's such a good quote. Continue." And yeah, it'll yeah. come back. To it, it. It'll swim back. It'll yeah. swim back. It always does it. Um, <laughs> it's interesting because my sister is, that's where she works is the, the business side of art. So it's, it's art publicity. She's got some interesting um, clients. Like one of them um, contacted me. Sorry, I'm going to stop you. I figured it out. Nice. I figured it <laughs> out. Um, so the reason that art is preserved over time is because it is a snapshot of culture at that period of time. And if something is invaluable, you're willing to throw it away. Think about a red solo cup. Yeah. That is ubiquitous and, and reproduce, reproducible across the board. You don't think about throwing a red solo cup away. No. But a piece of art that encapsulates the generation of the last 10 years, you're not going to want to throw that away. Yeah. AKA that is insanely valuable. So making art valuable is actually a function of preserving the culture of the time which you almost can't fake like that almost which you almost which you cannot the fake. soul yeah. like that is truly the, in the eye of the beholder but also that is truly an emotion that's evoked amongst everyone that looks at this piece yeah so that is why art is is expensive is because it is preserving culture and to not be thrown away it has to be expensive Interesting. So it's kind of like this this interesting paradox. It's of, almost like a paradox, a good word for it, yeah. 
It's like it needs to be expensive to be preserved and it needs to be preserved because it's important in culture. Yeah. So, you know, if I just like were to sketch a cartoon, you know, that's not an imperative of the culture that we're living in. But if, I don't know, a Baron Batch were to, to you know, etch a, an amazing painting that were to embody Pittsburgh in this point in time. Yeah. Then that becomes valuable because I don't want to so throw beautiful. that away. I, yeah. I think it's just so interesting because it's. Yeah. I'm a big business. I bring a business perspective to everything I well, think same. about. Yeah. And when I think about art, like I think, oh, the business of this thing is interesting. Sorry, it took yeah. me so long to figure no, no, that out. No, it's all good. I, I feel like people try to fake that too. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, just pricing something high so that you know people will think it's valuable and then. But what you're you're right. I mean, if if it's priced high and somebody spends that much money on, it, they're not going to psychologically want to part with it either. Mm -hmm. And then it preserves the culture. And there's also things that are just so inherently beautiful, like like the piece I saw on your wall from Baron Batch, like the mural painted on the wall in your mm -hmm. ear, mm -hmm. where you're just like that is it's incredible. Clear. Yeah. Like a Van Gogh uh, Starry Night or something yeah, like exactly. that. Like, that is an incredible spectacle to look at. It I don't is. even know if that's the time. I feel like that's Van Gogh's ego being projected or, or just his, his train of consciousness. Well, that's the thing about art is it's just as much provenance as it is culture. Provenance? <laughs> provenance is uh, another thing I learned from a Netflix documentary. It is the story behind the art. Okay. Since art is so speculative, an accompanying story will boost its value. Essentially. Essentially. What's the story of the story so, like, you know? Or... Uh, just the provenance of Van Gogh during the time. Like, he was at the peak of his artistic career at that point in time, and thus anything produced in that has the provenance of, like, Van Gogh at his peak. And thus, like, it should be perceived as a little bit elevated. It's funny you mentioned which that. kind of ar argues the point that we were talking about about a little bit of like not knowing the artist. Yeah, but that is a piece of the value proposition. But you almost outside get to know of, the like, viewing the art. Yeah, exactly. And so I remember I was at um, it wasn't MoMA. It was the Whitney in New York. Okay. And um, I was with my brother and my sister in law, who at that point hadn't married my brother yet. And um, I'm usually not into art museums because I, I just I just haven't really gotten deep into that world. I like it, but I just haven't gotten deep into that world yet. There are other things you'd rather do. That's fair. Yeah. Well, at least at this point in my life, I'm open to new experiences. Yeah. So, which is good. Thank you. Good. Um, but I remember seeing there was like a Warhol exhibit at the time, and I grew up in Pittsburgh. I remember my family shouted about Andy Warhol, which I think turned me off to it. I was just like, oh, everyone else is doing this. I don't want to be interested in it. <laughs> okay. But I remember going to this particular exhibit, the Whitney, and just kind of seeing the beauty in Warhol's work for the first time and really appreciating like a lot of that, you know, because it showed early pictures and, and it was literally just sketches that like some kid was making. So it was like he drew a picture of a penis with a bow around it in his notebook, which it Warhol was, did in the 40s. This was his earliest work that they showed. It was just sketches he was doing like just to kill time. It was like, like when I was in grad school or when I was an undergrad, I would write like schematics for things I thought would be interesting. Yeah. And it was just my way of, you know, like just kind of passing the hours in class. But I just thought it was funny that they put that in the museum. You know, that was like, like Warhol probably never thought that would end up in a museum, right? When he was doing that. Warhol said like, I hope nobody else ever sees this probably. Probably. Because <laughs> yeah. like I've been in, the, you know, I have that journal that I hope nobody else ever sees. Yeah, um, same. But that's. But it shows progression. It shows incremental progress. Um, you know, it, it's something that was going on at that individual human's mind Correct. in that individual point in time, which is cool. kind of significant. It's sort of beautiful, I mean, to, to be able to get in someone's psyche in that way. Yeah. Like we talked earlier about nothing being original, but that, that moment had originality in it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Which is interesting. I agree. Because not everything does. Well, the other thing I remember from that exhibit was there was um, there was a piece. Well, it was considered a piece. I don't think it was a piece. You know, so you know at the Andy Warhol Museum, the balloons you mm -hmm. see? Mm -hmm. So what it is, is it's mylar pillows that are filled up with just air and you push them around a room. And when we were kids, we were little terrorists and we would, we would like sit on all the balloons and push them in the corner and we would get yelled at a hell of a lot. And so going back, um, I remember... Um, and, and seeing it was basically it was it was an acrylic um it was about two inch thick acrylic with uh uh dowels that were made of acrylic through it and then they had pins in the side of the acrylic dowels to hold it in place and it was an interesting but rudimentary design like as an engineer i was like eh, 
you could do better. <laughs> yeah. And so I remember I was like going up to it to kind of like look at it, and I almost touched it. And one of the guards at the window yelled at me, he's like, that's a priceless piece of art. I'm like, it's a jig. Priceless? I could have made this for 200 bucks. Yeah, exactly. It's the dude's jig. He was just making stuff, and that was what he did to make it quicker. <sighs> and so I remember thinking like, like, the difference in perspective between me and that guard at the time you know, like, I'm thinking of it from the perspective of Warhol, like, you know, like, I'm just hanging out and, like, th this is how I would have built it. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and he's thinking of it, like, it's his job to guard this piece of art. You Difference know. in perspectives. Exactly. And so that, right. that to me, was a really interesting... I mean, I, I He's probably, trying to be in that positive in protecting the integrity of the things in the building, the thing he was hired for. Yeah. And you're trying to be in that positive in understanding the way these things all went together. You know, it's just conflicting viewpoints. Correct. But it's also the same viewpoint, which is really interesting. Like you said, it's a <laughs> literally the same viewpoint. Yeah. Yes, that's funny. <laughs> that's kind of ironic, actually. Thanks. But no, it is. It, honestly, art has been a, a weird tertiary domain in my life. I feel like I, I've been enjoying getting to know a little bit from a business perspective, from a artist perspective, from a... We were in New Orleans uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was just there uh, last week. Get out of here. Yeah. We probably had some overlap. Probably. I was there just for... Kristen uh, was actually giving me like advice of places to go. Everybody <laughs> has a place to go in New Orleans. <laughs> but Kristen used to live there. I didn't realize until recently. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, so she was like, she's like, go to these. And she was like texting me like, she sent me a wall of text. To oh, geez. To I really could have used that. So Kristen, the old operations director at Deep Local when we both were mm -hmm. co-interns. Kristen like, actually hired me. Back in Sam, the day. She hired all of us. Yeah, yeah. She rejected one of my friends who was way more qualified than me for my internship. <laughs> That speaks to the fake until you make it. Kind yeah, of exactly. Thing um, no, but New Orleans. I've it, it was the same thing. We, my career, and I would be qualified now. We <laughs> ended up at a Seuss, uh, uh, a Seuss gallery, with and Doctor Seuss. Uh, Doctor Seuss. That's cool. And Seuss is particularly interesting right now for the re or for the listeners because uh, he's being canceled. I've heard about and that. So essentially. He's not really being canceled. Six of his books are being pulled, directed by his estate. It's not like an external party that's saying to be pulled. Six of the six of his books are being pulled by his estate, saying that I like, didn't get all the things you yeah, will see. Yeah, these are these are <laughs> concepts that were acceptable forty years ago. They are no longer acceptable. We don't want to we don't want to reciprocate these ideas yeah, out of the public. Perfect. Yes, that's a better word. Um, um, so we're going to pull these voluntarily. Like, you know, Dr. Seuss is still relevant. He's a great children's author. He writes amazing, amazing work. But so we ended up at a Seuss gallery um, looking to purchase some of his work. And like, nice. I would have never, I would have never ended up there had I not through the process of Deep Local started to appreciate art and just start to look at it from an open mind. Like, oh, what we do is also art. So. Of you know, what is that artist bringing to the table that I could maybe think about technically? Yeah. And so... You were going to buy a Seuss? Well, so cool. we thought so. But they were all prints at the gallery, um, which is a totally valid thing and can be I've valuable. i got a couple of prints. Given, like, a limited run nature of the print and the quality of the print and how it all is, is done out, I don't know enough to really be saying anything about this. That's all good. But... Um, so we were we were entertaining buying a print for a while and, and actually still entertaining it because one of the ones we have our eye on is from one of the canceled books, which I oh, think nice. will add to the provenance I think of so, the too. piece um, and thus make it more valuable in an attempt to trade up in well, an art collection. In my opinion, like there's nothing wrong with looking at something for a historical context, and this might be a little bit controversial, but... You don't have to agree with everything in the thing. You don't have to think like that's correct by today's standard, but it's interesting. And it's like you said, like it was earlier, you mentioned Baron Batch is sort of defining, you know, the art of the time. And I think, you know, Seuss defined the perspective of a lot of that time. And so, and also, and you can't expect his own to be 30 years ahead of his time. Correct. And the line keeps changing. And right. so, like, you know, if I say something over here and then the line moves over here, 
Like, it's kind of silly to get mad at me for what I said when the line was there. Right. You know? If in so, 30 years they play this podcast back and we have said something offensive because the the rules of the culture have changed, yeah. we are trying to be as forward thinking and as, as positive. Yeah. Now, both as of us are pretty open minded, friendly, right. loving individuals. Right. You know? if, so. if something comes to my attention that jars my view of reality, I will openly try to integrate that with my way of thinking. Correct. But I. I can't act on something I don't know. <laughs> and you can't anticipate In the same every suits, single... He couldn't act on something he didn't know about. Like, this mm-hmm. was the standard knowledge of the time. He was forward-thinking and innovative in the way... Like, that's why we still admire his work. Yeah. And so, no, I'm like... Uh, this has been a topic my fiancé and I have really dug into a depth. Yeah. To um, just kind of have a little tit and tat. But... Yeah. I honestly, I'm I'm feeling more positive toward doing it just because, um, like I said, prints in the right capacity do have value, and I think it adds to the provenance. Yeah. Well, it's kind of so, cool, too. Well, the provenance. Can you define provenance? I'm sorry. I'm yeah. So one more time. Uh, so provenance is the historical context and story around a piece. So it could be this piece was painted in XYZ by so-and-so, provenance. but also it was like, oh... If Joe Schmo says they found this piece in the basement, if Joe Schmo says they found 10 Picasso pieces in the basement <laughs> of their New Jersey place out of the blue, that seems fishy as hell. That's the provenance. If, if you know, legit Larry comes and says he purchased this piece from this person who purchased this piece from this person and had a certificate from a gallery, it is very clear this discussion around provenance was a little bit about the the legitimacy of the art. Okay, so was it really from that artist? Right. Yeah. But it also ties into like the story because I think people do buy art on stories and on provenance and on yeah. so it's the provenance, feeling. So that's the origin of the, the art piece. It is the origin and the story around the piece. It okay. is the it is when you go and not just the it is when you're Spencer that. sitting here at your house and you're having a dinner party and your buddies walk up and you say Look at this amazing piece, Spencer. What is this? And you start to tell the story. That is the provenance. The story that you tell yeah. around this piece. I acquired yeah. this piece from so-and-so. This piece makes me feel X, Y, and Z ways. This piece has been owned by so-and-so down the line. It came from an, you know, that is the provenance so like this of piece the piece was in the block. Louvre, then like Joseph Goebbels took it and tried to get it back. Right. And then the Allies came and liberated Germany. Yes. And then it ended up in an American collection. Right. And that's how it wound up in the basement of New Jersey. Yes. Okay, that's provenance. And provenance also speaks of legit legitimacy of art. So is this a real or a fake? And and that's something that the Netflix documentary I'm referencing kind of speaks to. What's the name of the documentary? I've got to look it up for you. you can no put worries. It in, Spencer will put this in the speaker notes, I'm sure. Yeah, well, I'm not going to um, But I will, I will find, this, I will <laughs> find the name of the documentary. If yeah. you're still with us at this point, God bless, bless you. you. <laughs> yeah. We have, we have gone far from engineering into art. Yeah. Which well, may this not is nice. be that far from engineering. Well, I think I'm actually, respond. so we, we put titles on the end of these typically of, of just kind of like a general theme. And I think this one might be like where engineering meets art, you know, because. I like that. Yeah. I like that. I believe that in Deep Local. I believe that. It in definitely fits the Deep discussion Local. discussion that we've had. And I think both of our philosophies as well. And I think that speaks a lot to what we've been talking about, about the analytical mind versus the creative mind and maybe where we all fall on that spectrum yeah well and it is a spectrum they're not all that different and everything's a spectrum in my opinion yeah i love binary i've got it on my arm but everything <laughs> is a spectrum you might have to get a closer look at that yeah no yeah case. please okay, ASCII, cool. ascii binary so dash eight digits dot. it's eight bits wide okay. so there would be 32 bits on there for my last name of prom and so it would be Dash, dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, 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 dash. I've never actually done this. <laughs> but it's on you. It is on me. I promise you, that says prom and ASCII. That's awesome. Just dashes and dots. I originally tried to do like actual dashes and dots and I didn't think that looked as compelling. Yeah, so I, I, like the, like I like the horizontal line. alternating dash. Sorry, the vertical line, yeah, yeah. for the dot. Like after the after this, I'll pull up like the next iteration, but I have, this is gonna expand twice fold when I get the next piece of work done. 
Nice. Um, so, yeah. So I've, there's two pieces of ink I've been thinking about probably for like 11 years now. And I, I wanted to originally get them on the tops of my hands, but these days I like body modifications that you can't see through a suit. Okay. Just because of the nature fair, of my work. Fair. And so even though I'm putting this on blast for a podcast, <laughs> but the ones that I've always wanted is I, I was considering a different career and it is still a passion of mine to cook. And so very cool. When I was an undergraduate, I would do sushi um, as, as a professional for like four hours in the morning. I would wake up at 6 a.m. and I worked for a catering company. I would roll out like 400 California rolls. Damn, and it was fun. That's then, that is fun. And I remember um, my my boss was, and I don't know if this is politically correct. I'll say anyway. My boss was a white guy, and he's one of the few white guys to make sushi. Okay. My coworker was a black guy. Both awesome guys. I, I both really good, nice people. Uh, the guy was don't remember their names. <laughs> this is a while ago, and so um, basically, um, I just remember. Um, just really be an influence like the fact that like you know like i really enjoyed this work i like talking to my coworkers. it felt a little bit creative but still very mechanical and so yeah you were almost doing, like an assembly line exactly it wasn't it was exactly that and so you're doing repetitive motion um we would do it it's almost as, meditative it was in the and, way and i felt really at peace it was it was the and i also worked as a research programmer at the same point, <laughs> point in time so talk about juxtaposition exactly i would i would do sushi in the morning for four hours I would go to class. I was taking a business course load because I double majored in business and computer science. And then I would go and do programming for the evening. Jeez. In the afternoon. So it was a really good task diverse day. Yeah. And Talk it, about context switching. Yeah, exactly. It was, but it, for some reason it wasn't that difficult at the time. Like I, the business stuff was kind of, I don't want to say mindless because business takes a lot of intelligence, but I think being a business student, um, no disrespect to business students, but not as much as actually running a business or, or making real life business decisions. It, it, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a lightweight course load. If I'm being honest, like benchmarked against our computer science course load. If uh, you just go ahead and go to, yeah, YouTube. All I really want to show you is he's sized and shaped like me. So Dustin Johnson's yeah, so about six, three, 190 pounds. The 13. And he really swings a golf club quite this is amazingly. Dustin Johnson on the 13th hole. Oh, holy crap. And it is very. He loud. swings it pretty effortlessly, pretty compact. All you engineer. Oh, you see that? All, he dunked it, that one. That's then. All the engineers will appreciate how efficient his golf swing is. He wastes no motion in his, his golf caddy swing. caddy high five him? <laughs> So what we're talking about here is kind of the origins of, if you go ahead and pause this. Yeah, sure. We're talking a little bit about the origins of the desire to want to build a software platform. And so I had been working at Deep Local a long time. I had built a lot of one-offs. I had worked on three month projects that lived for a weekend at Google I.O. or similar projects. And then you kick that project to the curb, you know, a thousand hours sunk into a hard engineering effort and it would be no more. And part of that is nice in that it clears up a lot of brain space, but part of that feels like wasted effort. Yeah. And, you know, I, I did a lot of work toward that and not one bit of it lives on. And we talked a lot earlier about like ripple effects and impact. And I, I believe that that is all existing for the brand client. But in terms of me personally, from an engineering effort, yeah, all of that effort is kind of gone. I've, I've learned my lessons and I, I can move on. Mandala where like you make something in the sand and then you just get rid of it. No, but that's a great allegory. I'm not really sure what the Mandala. Well, it's, it's like a Buddhist tradition where like people will like make a really oh yeah the intricate designs design. yeah yeah and they'll just comb the zen it. gardens they're exactly. beautiful no yeah i probably get the name wrong but that's that's what i was thinking i need to look into that yeah buddhist culture is one i've been like particularly it's, interested it's the in the only lately. religion that really makes sense to, not to get too philosophical or controversial here. second it second it yeah. i'd love it we talked about personal stuff earlier i'd love to talk a little bit about my meditation experiences lately but no i, I was on a story so talking about interest in developing software, 
my previous experience to, to kind of aligning my, that desire with my direct work in gun band, I'd previously built a tool to compare myself in my video clip with an arbitrary kind of video or YouTube clip. So I had, this is for my golf swing. Yeah. Um, I had kind of a side-by-side -side tool. I was working in React at the time, so I wanted to kind of get familiar with that, my team. One of my super smart team members was using React and we weren't comfortable with React. I know so I one. wanted to get an idea of like, is this the real deal? Should we stick with this or should we kind of move on? Robot operating system recently has been that way, but I don't Ross, know. Ross, oh, yeah. we got to talk about Ross later because sure. I'm curious about that too. So I built this tool in React to compare my videos side by side to any arbitrary video. So I pulled up a bunch of videos of Dustin Johnson, found an eight iron swing, went to the range, recorded the same eight iron swing for myself. One of the features of my tool was to be able to time the clips in between key points. Interesting. So I would start at the takeaway at the golf swing. When you started to move your club, I would tag that key point. Were you able to detect point. that or you tagged it? Okay. I would love to, long term of this tool, I was gonna use an AI to detect all of the key points in the swing. Cool. To start to trace that and give you golf feedback on coaching. And then it was also supposed to kind of connect you to local, um, like local facilities to help you practice and enforce that. Yeah. So I had a few outlets long term, but then we'll talk about I had moved on. Um, so I built this tool. I had worked all odd hours of the night to kind of put this thing together. I really wanted it to work. I knew it would be effective for myself to make me a better golfer. All I had to do was look at side by side what I was doing and what Dustin Johnson was doing. And if I could just compare the differences and use him as a model, I could be a scratch pro golfer. So that's what I was working on. That's awesome. Um, I was building that as a software platform because I didn't really know what people would use it for. I thought maybe gymnastics or goalie coaching because I was a hockey player and I had a bunch of goalie coaches that would record footage. Yeah. So like I thought maybe Any kind you of mocap use... analysis has got broad exactly. potential. And I'll tell you about some other examples when exactly you exactly that. you got to give me five minutes. No, no, I'm going to. But so I was working on this software platform for a while. I worked on it literally from, you know, I'd get home at five. This was back in the normal day when you would go into an office every day and come home at the end of the day. And uh, I was working on it. I'd go Before home, four. deal with my family things and eat my dinner. And I'd work, you know, till about eight o'clock. And I'd work eight to 12 on this random software platform just for myself because I, I knew it would help me be a better golfer. Yeah. Eventually... That in its own helped me identify like, Oscar, you're interested in building a software tool, a software platform that can be used by many people, not something that can be used once, but something that can be used many times over kind of on its own. Yeah. And so I'd recognize that because like, you don't just spend your three hours of personal time on nothing you know you spend your three hours of personal time on the things you really want to be doing if you want to know what a person values you look at how you, they spend their time yeah and so recognizing that, that that was what i want to do i said how can i develop a platform but get paid to do it how can i develop a platform on behalf of deep local and what we have to offer as a as a company we're building something new every time there's no way you can abstract that and build it once yeah this was four years ago when I just gotten hired at Deep Local and I was like, you know, a dumb kid just learning that creative technology existed. What's well, amazing how much more you learn in industry than you do in academia and you think you know everything before you hit industry. Oh gosh, don't get me started in yeah. all of that. I'm that guy too. I recently got a little bit of pushback about a GPA for a potential intern candidate, which I was but the severely... GPA? I severely disagree with because who cares about that? I mean, that's, that's uh, the, so arbitrary. the particularly gifted student I'm interested in had done a product, a, a kind of design centric project for the school of the deaf, where he developed a backpack that had vibrated and reacted physically to music. 
that was being played for these these disabled students. Yeah, it's really cool. And and then it allowed them to interact in a way that they could interact collectively. They dance. could never do that. They yeah. can dance together as yeah. a group where they could never do anything like that. He identified that need. He created a solution. He used a business oriented approach to funding and he actually open sourced the design to help some other, you know, schools around the country use similar technology. Nice. I mean, that story in and of itself is amazing to me. And so to think that, uh, maybe he got a C plus in chemistry and <laughs> engineering bit pit. And it's like, are you kidding me? So my um, opinion of GPA is, is who cares? I mean, if somebody doesn't even have a college degree, but they're good at what they do. I mean, to me, and this is going to sound maybe a little bit jaded to our viewers, but I, I think what somebody accomplishes in industry and, and through their work is so much more meaningful than a grade or what they do in school, because it's a matter of motivation. And so, if you see it as arbitrary or, or not really connected to the real world, I mean, it's cliche, but like look at like Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Steve, um, not Wozniak, but uh, Ballmer from, from Microsoft. Mm -hmm. These guys all dropped out of school to go and do something they wanted to do. Um, it's Elon all about Musk's motivation. partner at SpaceX, uh, Peter Thiel, mm -hmm. will pay people like they'll give he'll give them like a hundred grand. I, I don't know what the exact the Thiel scholarship. Is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm aware of that one. What's the amount? I don't think it's a hundred, but it's a good amount of money. Essentially, he'll he'll fund your company. He'll yeah. fund your company to drop out of school if you have a good idea. And a we had a client who was a Teal Scholar it, for a little bit. Really? Yeah. I would be very interested to hear what it's like to interact with Peter Teal. I hear he's a very particular guy. Yeah. The problem is at the time when we were working with that client, I didn't know the, the um, context of the Teal Scholarship. Mm. And so I didn't ask that question, but I would be interested too. Teal is a weird, interesting. But outside of that, getting back to our original, sure. like that is that the motivation. When I, I do a lot, I do all of our hiring for software at Deep Local, assisted by our HR team and some of our executives. And what I look for in a candidate is energy integrity and curiosity interesting i think if you have those three things everything else is learned everything else is applied everything else is context if you don't have integrity you have nothing if well, you don't I have curiosity you don't have motivation to work if you don't have energy you can't mo you know you can't personally so give give the you know, you have to give something. It's interesting you should say that. So for me, the one that I look at the most is integrity of those three. And then I think I also look at um, creativity is important. So that I guess mm -hmm. that's, that's in there too. But then I also look at, um, what is it? Experience, obviously. I, I don't, of course. We don't hire junior that often. So we go, we go for experienced people because we're working with clients, subsees. So it's like we'll get somebody that's done this a thousand times and then just let them you know, autopilot through it. Right. And that helps when you need the technical leadership on a project. Yeah. Well, like they can prove those experts can provide that. If you've got someone that needs something mission critical, I mean, you almost, but I, I do want to diversify our teams a little bit more and get junior people. I've had bad luck with our internship program, unfortunately. Um, In what way? So just we, that they weren't able to be effective. Correct. Or... And so we've had people that were just not, really correctly motivated or they were ineffective but i think they meant well and so i think the intention was good and i think a lot of the time what happened was it was just a lack of experience it was it was you haven't seen all the failure modes and so you didn't know where to go or the amount of oversight required to train that person was overly demanding and i think it's that yeah if you're asking my my opinion like at that early point you have to assume such little productive input and so much expertise to oversight. You really do. Yeah. I mean, people are early on in, these career, in their career and you're talking about mission critical systems. Correct. You need to have the expectation that that is not trained. That is not trained in a, in a collegiate setting. Well, that is not it. trained. There's no way. Right. You have so to just you have to you have to experience and fail, experience and fail, and then you have to see 
you have to derive the uh, the knowledge to be able to know how to succeed in the future. So you, you know diversion. somebody's coming in with zero experience in this terrain. Well, you you saw me when I was an intern at Deep Local. I was cavalier. I was irresponsible. I was not great at my job, and you know, since only that, half that's true. <laughs> I'll let you pick which half. Which half? <laughs> yeah. No, uh, it's all right. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, I think that is. Uh, but I really, I really think the internship internships are incredibly important. Teaching juniors is incredibly important. The programs in Germany for apprenticeships are celebrated in newspapers when people graduate those programs. Teaching I somebody a craft and teaching somebody a way of operating within a business that they can build their life on, they can build their family on, they can... Uh, I just think... Have you had this one? I have not. I have not. It's quite good. So this is a Basil Hayden. It's a Kentucky bourbon. Quite good. I like it a lot. And now for tonight's sponsor. <laughs> yeah, they didn't even pass. Um, <laughs> no, I think that stuff is incredibly important. Like. You know, we are the future of tomorrow. The youth of today is the future of then. There needs to be that pass down. You know, I have been, this is going to get incredibly personal, incredibly fast, sure. but I have been on the fence about children yeah, same. for some time. And one of the things that really keeps pulling me back into that arena is who will you pass on all this knowledge to? All of these, all of these ideas that you've worked so hard to understand. Who will then get to get to portray that knowledge that they don't have to learn it for themselves? That is why elders are so respected in every nationality because they have learned the lessons such that others will not have to go through those same steps. And that's what I think about all the time. It's well, like, that's, have you ever had how, the pleasure of, I'm oh, sorry. No, no, that, that's all I got. What I was going to say is, have you ever had the pleasure of like talking to somebody from like, that's lived through like World War II? I have. So. My grandfather is about 91 years old, still kicking it. That's awesome. He is doing great. And my fiance calls me grandfather World War II Great Depression because I'm like <laughs> super conservative. I just don't waste anything. Because that is what my family has grown up on. And my grandfather had grown up on all of that. And he raised my mom. My mom is, we are just not a family of waste. We turn the lights off when we leave the room. We do all the little things. You know, you might be a little chilly. Turn the heat down in the house and wear a hoodie. And you'll be okay. <laughs> Get a space heater. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, but my grandfather is my kicking grandmother, ass. Yeah, same. Like, I would always say there could be zero food and she would still manage to pull a feast out of that kitchen. No doubt. I believe that hundred percent. I believe the same thing in my grandmother. And one of the things I say to a lot of people is like, I think about him a lot such that he has experienced the technology increase from like radio as a form of entertainment to like, now he talks to my mom about pulling up, instruction manuals for his washer so he can like repair the shit himself he That's is all awesome. about fixing stuff he has a great workshop and he, he so he's gone that far right of like these are that's a lot of technological advance think about us yeah you and me we're gonna we see started, shit that would boggle our minds at we this point. start it's all compounding yeah correct. right like the correct. rate of that's advancement of technology is compounding it's and it's not integrated yeah. into the tattoo yet it's in the next design yeah but so i think a lot about like wow he's seen a lot he's such a smart man and i have so much to still extract out of his brain correct who am i gonna pass You're never all gonna of get this? It all. i'm never gonna get it all and then I'll have some piece of it. And then I have my own unique experiences and you do, and you do, and you do. And <laughs> you know, it, who are we going to pass that on to? Yeah. 
And so that it goes a lot back into the conversation about, you know, the, the tutoring and things like that. Like if there's any little way I can push people in the right direction, yeah, it is a job well done. It is a duty well served. I feel for you. I mean, like, so, I mean, this is going to get philosophical and personal, but I'm kind of a nihilist at heart. Okay. I, well, I believe in the long run, like in, in a thousand years, none of us are going to be probably. Yeah, remembered. but in the long, long run, we're all going to be in a dust. emergent dust that is yeah. ubiquitous across the universe. A hundred percent. However. That's why you're nihilist. While we're here. You just look very long term. While we're here. No, 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 but that is why I'm a nihilist. But why I think I'm a good person is that while I'm here, I can make a good impact on the people around me. I mean, that, that punk kid in New York that's now, you know, like happily doing what he loves. You still know, a punk kid, still living the dream. Correct. Yeah, still very much himself. But you gave him a bump in that direction. In the direction that he's happy, that he's happy at this in. Point. Yeah. That he's happy in. And yes. I can count, I mean, on both hands, like, I mean, probably more than that. I mean, the people that have come to me and said, you've influenced me in a good way. And it feels amazing. I mean, just to be able to have somebody go back to you and say, like, thank you, you know, you. That is the highest power. Yeah. You could be a trillionaire with a fucking Lamborghini and all the amazing trap trappings, all of the amazing trappings of the world. But what you can't have, you can't buy is integrity and energy and knowing that you've influenced things in a very, very positive way. Yeah, I agree. You can't buy that. You can't, you just have to live that. Correct. Yeah. I mean, integrity for sure. Influence things in a positive way for sure. Energy, can you define that? I guess you mean it. Totally. Totally. Uh, in its most simplest sense, that is what I believe about the world. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It is only transformed. Conservation of energy is Correct. one of the laws that they teach you in school at some Newton point. Something somebody, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody correct me on that. Um, sure. Yeah, but blindly, that blindly. is my religion. Yeah. I believe in conservation of energy and I try to apply that in you... absolutely everything that I do. And I try to understand the energy impact that I have, I try to look at the energy investment versus payoff. I look at things in terms of energy. Is energy a synonym for effort, enthusiasm, or both, or neither? All. Okay. Energy is an all-encompassing, universal energy. You could view it as the aura in this room. Okay. You could view it as the energy you bring to the conversation. You could view it as the energy of a marketing campaign yeah. you put out into the world. It's energy. It's all, it's, a, you know, how did that get to be? So it's almost like intent. Intent. Intent yeah. is a really good way to look at it. Yes. Yeah. Um, what is your intent? Yeah. Actually, my fiance and I, she's interviewing for a new job and we talked a lot about like relating the things she is saying back to the intent and back to like, how is this going to relate to the job that you're doing the intention? So yes, that's a good way to look at it. And I think a lot about intent in intent out. And so we talked a little bit about meditation. Yeah. So I'd like to do more because I want to be good at that. I, I have been trying for years to be good at that. And it is a very hard thing to do in such that it is so simple. It eludes you because you've been conditioned to be complicated. <laughs> Does that make sense? Sort of, yes, because I, I, I think that's true. So I remember when I was building that lighting system I told you about for SpaceX, mm -hmm. I, I had a buddy over who was a Buddhist and um, he was a flight attendant at the time. He flew in to Los Angeles. We were going to hang out and I was working those 80 hour weeks and I said, you know, Vaso, I love you. And that's the guy's name, Vaso, Serbian. And I said, um, I want to hang out with you, but I have all this work. And he's like, let me help you with it, brother. And so him and I sat down. I'm so excited to hear this I gave already. him some baseline training and him and I were harnessing and soldering and, and just building these things. And I feel the energy already. I feel what it was like to be in that room. Yeah, I nice, truly believe nice. that it was productive. 
I was really productive. do. We got a lot done. And so, I mean, this was, we just sat there. We were both at a table. But every, I want to say hour and a half or so, he would say, let's meditate. And I would say, I appreciate the free labor. <laughs> Gonna indulge and I'll do it. But then we'd sit down and we would both try to do it. I could not turn my brain off. Like I couldn't, it wouldn't stop. It, it just kept screaming to get back that. to work yeah. And, yeah. and to keep going. And, and so I wasn't good at it. I think it would be valuable to be good at it because I think it would help me be better in those moments of concentration. But I still haven't mastered that art or even begun to understand it. What I have found in my limited exposure that is the most curious is that at your times of most vulnerable, at your times of most calm, are your times of most focused. You, in some way, shutting off all your circuits, activate a higher level circuit <laughs> that drives maybe not the way things were wired before. Yeah. Maybe it kind of rewires things what? a little bit such that a connection you may not have made, you make intuitively. Kind of like, you don't even have to be thinking about it to be thinking about it. I'm inclined to agree. And so today, a couple of times, I took a five minute power nap, which is ludicrous. But I... Um, Not the espresso nap, right? What do you, what's the espresso nap? The espresso, uh, was some Silicon Valley trend where you you'd like chug an espresso and then go to sleep and wake up 20 minutes later and the espresso will have hit your system. So between the power nap and the espresso, <laughs> you're like fucking wired. Yeah, I that. At that point, you might as well just, you know, there are other options, but. Correct. Well, I've, I've done similar things in my life, I'm not gonna lie, but you today works my mouth. Correct, and so you try to get that however you can. And so today, my, my approach was, I had like little teeny snippets of time between meetings, and it was like I had 40 minutes, I'm, like, I'm gonna take a nap, this will be great, you know, I'm sleep deprived, this will be good for me. And then I get in bed and I'm like, I have these things to do. So from bed, I start calling up engineers and like coming up with like, what if we did this? How about that? What if, could this optimize this process? And so I worked on like a few different things. And then finally I, I'm like, okay, I should actually sleep. And I have five minutes left. <laughs> so, Cause you get in bed. I think that triggers, you know, like the pre-dream state. That's what makes you think to call those people. Interesting. And, and then you start to sleep and then, I just remember weird trains of thought that had nothing to do with work. And then I got up and I was invigorated and I got in some really good meetings after that. There you go. Yeah. You got to ride it's not that meditation, train. You, it's just a nap. No, no, but you have to ride that train when it's going. Yeah. You know, when you're thinking about those things and your energy is naturally flowing, you need to just ride that train. Yeah. It's pretty simple. It there. doesn't shut up now though. Like there's no solace. So I love it, but I, I but I'm it's with also, you there. I'm with end. you there, such that like when I'm in that state of mind and I'm trying to sleep in bed, I will not allow myself to be in bed because I'm trying to associate bed with sleep. And when I'm in that train of mind, I'm not going to sleep peacefully. Yeah. I have ideas; they're flowing. I need to get them on paper, one way or another. I need to get up, move to a different space, come Sounds back. Sounds like you have better with, sleep hygiene. It's important. All it the is. simple stuff is so important. I was just talking to somebody about this the other day. It's like all of the, everybody thinks about the big grand things that you can do. You read the headlines on TV. You see these things that are huge in nature. We are a globally connected society. And so in that nature, people feel like they have to be personally Globally connected 24 <laughs> seven, but if you miss an email, you're screwed end of the world. All you have is what you do every day. Yep. That is all you get is everybody gets it. Elon Musk gets it. You get it. I get it. You get it. Thank you. 24 hours a day, figure out what you want to do in those 24 hours. And the most important lesson my mom ever ta taught me was everything in moderation. Amen. I've got to get my little bit of work in. I've got to get my little bit of play in. In that, I've got to get my little bit of exercise, a little bit of good eating, a little bit of bad eating, <laughs> a little bit of fun. Yeah. 
You know, I just think... A little bit of travel. A little bit of travel, yeah. yeah. Hitting New Orleans, seeing some live music. It's beautiful. Oh, it was beautiful. It was a beautiful place. It's I really city. enjoyed it. Very walkable. Yeah. My my only negative about the city was my a good, good work buddy of mine lives in New Orleans and could have really shown me a good time. <laughs> and he was in Mexico recovering <laughs> from the project we talked about. That was a crazy three month timeline for a sports social entertainment industry at will not name. Yeah, so, of course. No, that makes sense. Um, that was the only bummer. I went to hang out with Brian B. I don't know Brian, but I would like to meet him after what you've said. The only guy that has a last name that matches his personality. Booze fucking wah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually. Uh, Brian Bourgeois, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. What makes him bourgeois? Is he just eating caviar like all the time? No, no. I once, I once had an experience down in Acacia with him. We had gone to Everyday Noodles with a small group of work friends that we knew would have a good time. So it was kind of the first time of us all going out as a group. We had a few drinks at Hidden Harbor before because everyday noodles is always popping on Friday nights. Got our seat at everyday noodles, had a great time. Jacob Finch, now music producer for PK Delay, had uh, had done the recommendations on everyday noodles. That was the first time I've ever been there. So thank you for the recommendation, Jay Finch. It's a good place. And then Brian Bougie takes us out to Acacia on Southside uh, Flats that night. And so I'm a few houses down. So my fiance and I parked the car, walked down. Bougie's already in there. He knows the bartender. <laughs> He's getting drinks, doing whatever. He hands me a shot glass. It's loud. I don't know what's going on. He's like, oh, this is something, this is something great. Like, try it out. Here you go. I just shoot it because I'm like, I don't know what this is. Like, thanks for the shot, Bougie. Appreciate it. <laughs> After I shoot it, he looks at me and he goes, bro, that was a $115 mezcal from the cornfields of Tulum. Holy no, no. I was like, so bougie. Uh, drinks, $115 mezcal shots by the sip, apparently. 15 a shot. So... That's insane. When I say he, you know, his name is deserving, that's what I mean. I see what you because mean. Because I don't know how I'd get my hands on a shot worth $115. But I think you have to pay $115. Yeah. So, uh, anyways, so, yeah. long story long at this point. It's all right. Um, I had gone out, had a great time with a couple of coworkers that ha I had an intuition would have a good time, and they they did not disappoint. We ended up closing down Acacia. <laughs> I have an amazing story that I have told so many times. Um, and experience is, is, that's why we value old people, because yeah. of experience. Well, they've you done know, that stuff. They've done that. They've had 10 of those Acacia moments Correct. that they'll tell you about. All they've you done it in Cuba before Castro came in. Right. All yeah. you have to do is ask. And that's what I think is like, you know, so interesting talking to my pack. If I can ask the right questions, I can get such interesting information. My granddad, before he died, um, he was, he dropped out of medical school in order to join uh, as an army medic during World War II. They all did. Everyone right, in that generation right. was in World War II in some capacity. And... Um, his cousin, Marvin Krauss, was in the uh, Jewish mob, Murder Incorporated. So, uh, in, uh, he was... That's the he, Netflix thing, right? I don't Murder know, Inc. Like, it, does Netflix have a thing on it? Huh? Yeah, I think so. You gotta watch that. Sorry, I didn't mean no, to interrupt no, 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 your good story. No, it's all Go good. I, I want to watch that Netflix doc now. But, so, yeah, my, my granddad's cousin, Marvin Krauss, was in Murder, Inc. Um, he had uh, some stake in some casinos out in Cuba before Castro came in and he would date all these girls and they would give him money and that would finance his life basically. And so he, he had a bunch of different things going on. Interesting and, uh, family history though. Thank you. <laughs> Apple doesn't fall How did you learn history. about 
all of that. <laughs> like, is that just through family stories or? Correct. Yeah, that's from family stories, and so, and a little bit of like looking around on, on the internet. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, I remember he uh, he apparently was the floor manager. So after Castro kicked out all the Americans, he was the floor manager for the Caesar's Palace in Vegas. And then some family members say he was the inspiration for De Niro's character in Casino. But I don't know if I believe that or not. Like, it might have been somebody else. It seems a little bit... Sounds grandiose. like good provenance to me. Good provenance for sure. <laughs> but, you know, who, who knows if it's true or not. And so, anyway, um, there's a few other ones that are weird from that point in time. But apparently he, um, he came home one day and his girlfriend had been ice-picked to death. And um, there's speculation as to whether or not he was involved, because that's how you it's broke up. Only in involved days. in a Christmas story. Yeah. That's all. Wait, what? This is. Uh... And then he ended up just dying in Florida because he's Jewish, and so that's, that's where we all got. Jeez. So. Family history. Everybody's family history has something, huh? Yeah. There's another one. Like, so my mom, my grandmother was married like four times, right? And three or four times, and. Um, we think she was a trophy woman. We found all these martini glasses and like, I mean, I, she just, I have a ring, which I'm not wearing now, but it's three snake heads with diamonds for eyes. And, that um, sounds pretty sick. It's pretty slick. Yeah. There's uh, it's a cool ring, but the guy apparently knew like, uh, like Prince Faisal and like Churchill and Eisenhower. And my mom will tell a story about when Winston Churchill came to her house in uh, Great Neck, New York, when she was growing up. And like all the kids got. What's the banished. chance that's true? I would give it a forty percent. Forty? Okay. In my opinion, from what I've heard, my it's mom. Still a good story. My, my mom swears up and down. It's true, but just from talking to other relatives, like I would give it a forty. Listen, I know how many details I've forgotten in the last fifteen years, so I can only imagine when you get to be. 50, 60. And then, you know, pass it some telephone game generational gaps. Right. right? Yeah. Like, it's all speculative. Correct. But, fun to think about. Thanks, Spencer. Thank you, Oscar. Appreciate it. It's been a real pleasure to catch up with you. We have been holding a lot back in our last couple conversations Same. just to get it all out here. Um, but this has been a far reaching conversation. And I hope somebody finds something useful here. <laughs> Likewise, yeah, I, I, I hope this is informative for somebody out there and thank you for joining us. Hey, if you like what you just saw, please smash that like button, click subscribe. It's your support that'll let us keep doing this. We can improve our production value, start releasing these more often. The more people like it, the more of these we're gonna put out. So if you like it, subscribe, tell your friends. Thank you so much, you're the best.